ashes The spirits light up the night Looking down the edge of forever So stop me and take my advice Hello, hello Hello How are you doing? Good See, have you ever tried dragon fruit? <laughs> dragon fruit Dragon yes. fruit uh, I... You know what? I like does a vitamin water count? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh my god, I just had some. It's so weird. It's like um it's called honey dragon fruit. I don't know mm. what that means. So I thought I'd try it. It's from Target. Cut it open, it's like white inside, full of millions of black seeds. It looks like you're eating a bunch of bugs. But the seeds are good. They're like they like crunch into a they're really crispy. I don't know. It's really weird. And, and it's okay to eat the seeds. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess. I, just I hope so. Really <laughs> I think I set a record for the most seeds ever eaten. It was, so good. It was good. It was good. Yeah, and then I had to put my socks on, and I realized I got out of breath putting my socks on, and I'm like, okay, I got to get in shape for summer. Yeah, me too. And you realize it was snowing today again. Styrofoam snow. Yeah, but in April. Tuesday, Tuesday, we're going to have 70. 70? Is this 70. for real? For real, Tuesday. It's coming, man. No, I've got to, hopefully it'll melt that 20 feet of snow I have in my yard. Oh, I know. It's insane. You have no idea. Okay, so tonight we have Russell Accord on. And yes. Russell's a super nice guy. I got to meet him a couple of times. Um, hang out with him, have a few pops. Pepsis, as they say. Hey, he's put up with me, so he can't be that bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's a great guy and yeah. obviously very knowledgeable and has a lot of survival skills. Been in the military, um, obviously, is a star on the um, show Expedition Bigfoot. And he'll be on at the bottom of the hour, hopefully. Yeah, I'm excited. Me, just give me the nod when he gets in the green room. Yeah, yeah, I'll let you know when I see him in the back room. Yeah, okay. All right. So um, let's see here. What do we got? Okay. So I've got, a, you know, just some weird things tonight I want to talk about. Just weird things that were either brought to my attention or things I learned and I want to share because some of them are really, they are really weird. And the, the last thing I'm going to bring, talk about before Russell comes on will actually freak you out. Oh, really? If it doesn't freak you out, you're not human. And what I mean by freak out will really make you think. Like, really think, okay? All right. Okay. So I don't want to. And let's, um, by the way, I'm going to do a pop trivia thing at some point. And we'll uh, give away, let's see, um, what book should we give away? Uh, trying to think. Got any ideas? Uh, I don't know, but let's give away, an, whatever it is, it could be anything, but let's give away an ebook. <laughs> oh, Okay. All right. Because every two? time someone wins, they live in like, you know, Italy. <laughs> well, we'll give away some print books, but if you want to give away, let's give away two ebooks today then. Okay. Two of them. Okay. First, I'm going to do something here because, like a dork, I opened my wrong email, I think. Yes, I am, Tim. <laughs> you are what? He's called me cheap. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, yeah, I see that. Yeah. Alex, you're cheap. Well, we can be cheap once in a while. We've given away a lot of stuff. We'll keep doing it. We're gonna this summer we gotta give away something really big again. Yeah, yeah, do something fun. Big. Tell no, you what, big. tell you what, I'll allow you to give away a physical book if they're in the USA. <laughs> <laughs> Outside the USA, you get an ebook. <laughs> oh my God, my trivia! I had this trivia question all planned out. Oh no! And I don't see it, and I'm like, no, no, it should be here. Okay, I'll I'll run into it. It's on this. Okay, so um, so Pat Collins brought brought to my attention because he knows we do weird news on Untold Radio. So he brought together, brought this little fact that I'd never heard of this. Have you ever heard of a walking tree? No. So Pat Collins obviously wanted me to know about the walking tree. And I thought, 
Sounds kind of familiar, but not really. In can trees, you know, well, obviously in slow motion, right? But do trees really move, like change location? And so he sent me this article. I did my own research, backed it up. There was a little bit of controversy on it, you know, but there were some scientific studies. So this this is a, a walking tree down in Central South America, right? And apparently it can move up to 20 meters a year. 20 meters a year. I'm sure if you had this damn thing in your yard. <laughs> That's faster than some people move. 20 meters is quite a bit. I mean, a meter is almost three feet. So, so that's like 60 feet. This is like right out of Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But apparently this tree can go 25 meters tall. It's basically a, basically a palm tree with exposed roots, and I'll get into the scientific name. But it grows down in like Ecuador and whatnot. Um, hold on here. I'm still having note problems. So it's called the walking palm. It's pollinated by beetles only. Right. So what it does is apparently um, it lives in like flooded areas. So as waters come in and the soil gets a little too wet some years, it like pulls up its roots from the rear where the water is. They actually um, retract and then it, it then it grows new ones out in front and starts leaning and then it starts, you know, rebuilding. And it keeps doing this and keeps repeating this process. So let's say it's a rainy year and the water keeps rising. So that's the years it's going to move. Isn't that cool? Yeah, super cool. Never knew that. Yeah. So there's been studies like the Academy of Sciences in uh, Bratislava. Have you ever heard of that? I uh, No. No. <laughs> Don't even go there. Anyhow, um, so a paleo, paleobotanist. Um, Peter Vysonsky of the Slovak Academy of Sciences um, actually did a pretty big study on it. So, and that's just what they do. They lift in the rear and they they wither then and retract. I didn't want to show a picture because they kind of look like, um, I didn't want to get his band again. They, they kind of look like, you know what? <laughs> I'm just like, I'm not going there. Okay. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see here. Um, oh, yeah. I gave you a photo. Photo one. Photo one. I sent one. you a photo. Photo one. Yeah. Let me grab it. Yeah. Got to show it. But the roots are really cool. But these things kind of grow in the jungles. So they're not going to be like some you're going to have in your yard. Like deep in the Ecuadorian jungles. Mm. So there you go. That's it. The thing walks moves so and there is something to the myths yeah and then speaking yeah of course like just like the wizard of Oz. so speaking of strange plant information there is another new study literally put out five days ago they have recorded plants speaking sound speaking with sound sound yeah they create sound like tomato plants um, create this sound, and I actually listened to it. Um, it's like a clicking or a bubble bubble wrap popping sound, and like a tomato plant will speak, but it only it does more of it when it's like dehydrated, like I am right now. So I need to pour some of my purple junk. See, I do have it. I'm serious, uh, <laughs> into my mini cup, which I'm, I do have some. I have too many cups. Um, anyhow, so plants actually create noise, but the noise is only recorded with a special mic because they do they do this sound in a very kind of a ultra frequency. But this microphone then um, records it, then they decode it. So they're able so, to decode it. So not only do plants speak, they, apparently most of them do. They've only done so many, but they actually... Um, can even distinguish what plant it is by its voice. Wow. Like what type of plant. Down to that level. But you remember when people would say, talk to your plants, talk to your house plants? You yeah. Remember that? Yeah. So it's apparently true. Apparently they're talking back. We just couldn't hear them. But I thought it was just really cool. And so, like I said, it sounds kind of like bubble wrap pops and clicks. Um, so let's see here. Any new information I didn't already remember? 
Um, like I said, healthy plants speak less. Sick plants talk more. Obviously, they're looking for help. But they apparently 10 years ago, they figured this out with the conifer trees. Mm. So I, like I said, did my own research. And so conifer trees were done 10 years ago about. And they will even like the, um, the needles will talk to the roots. The roots then will talk to the needles. Isn't that weird? Yeah. So the squeaky wheel gets greased. Yeah. Well, you're just full of those <laughs> little <laughs> phrases. Pretty cute. Okay. So um, that's about it. I mean, that's enough of that. But I just thought it's pretty cool. So if you want to hear plants talk after this show is over, then you can do your own research and you can hear them. I didn't want to play it because it's not that it's not that exciting. You know, I can do it. Mm. There you go. I'm a tomato plant. <laughs> It's my impersonation. I, you know what the number one thing they say? I don't know. Pick me, pick me, pick me. I don't know. I know you're going to forget to water me again, you SOB. Well, I don't think they're, I, I think they're talking, I think they're talking to, maybe the tomato plant's talking to the tomato. So to, the, to, the, to the tomato that they're growing on. Yeah, they talk to their own organs. Man, it's kind of weird. Makes me think of that movie Sausage Party. What? How does? Okay, <laughs> go ahead and explain before we go on. So it's a, it's it's like they're making fun of Pixar movies, and it's like all like everything in the grocery store is alive, and it gets taken away by people and eaten. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was funny, wasn't it? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just I didn't get it. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. I don't get it. No, whatever. I don't need to. Enough of that crap. Okay. Um, scientists find fish at the lowest depth ever recorded, twenty-seven thousand feet. And I sent you a photo too of this very ugly, kind of strange fish. Doesn't know if it's a uh, some kind of lizard or an eel or a mud puppy or God knows. It's kind of all of the above. Is that a birthday hat? It's pretty. No, that's another fish. Oh, okay. Behind him. Oh, got it. But I thought it was interesting because I've worked on, you know, I'm working on that camera system that I want to put it <laughs> twice as deep as that thing. Um, I'm already getting in trouble. Why? <laughs> what, I teasing you? Strike one, Alex. <laughs> Are they striking you? Okay. Anyhow, um, I'm I've got I'm just gonna block the comments slow down with this little <laughs> word. Okay, but I thought it was cool. It's called a snailfish. This fish. It's cool. But see, I want to put a camera down fifty-two thousand feet or fifty thousand forty-seven. I want to be way farther than this with my system. And you think there's just a ton of life? We there might no, not a ton. No, 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 not a ton. I don't think there's a ton, but then they'll be interesting, whatever it is. So unique. Unique, very like this. It's pretty yeah. unique, right? Yeah. I think it's unique. Yeah. I wouldn't want to like wanna touch it. Looks like a frog fish. Yeah, it's kind of weird. It's like it's growing arms. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, that was a real scientific explanation. But it was filmed in the Izu. Agasawara Trench, South Japan, that one. Mm. Okay. So now uh, we're going to go the opposite direction. We're going to go up, up, up to Mars. <clears throat> is Mars up? Right? Yeah, Mars is Mars is uh, it's up. up. We think of the, we think of Mars as way up, right? Yeah, but it's not really. You know, it's, it's it's down. It could be anywhere. Yeah, we don't. We just think of it as up. Yeah. Because at night we see it up. We see it up. But we're probably upside down when we're looking at it. We'll is there a, it. any, and even is there an up and down in space? It's all, it's all a perspective. Do you know you locked up your camera and your eyes were shut? That's a good look. Yeah. That's, <laughs> it's a nice look. <laughs> okay. So anyhow, on Mars, did you know there's a helicopter on Mars flying around? No. Did you, see, most people don't know that, which is weird to me. How could you not know that? Like a robot? Yeah, well, it's a drone. Yeah, I mean, drone. We're, we're not up there. 
But we no one's up there it. with a joystick, huh? But we sent it. Well, yeah. How do you think it got there? Of course, well, we sent well it. I didn't know if it was an alien helicopter. No, 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 no. There's a Mars helicopter. It's called Ingenuity. Ingenuity. So apparently, it set a new record on speed and height. So it went 52 feet high and 14 miles an hour. That's incredible. Isn't that? It just sounds incredible, doesn't it? 52 feet high. Wow, we're really going up there. But anyhow, I think it's cool. I just, but I do find it interesting that people don't know that there's actually a helicopter. You know, we have the rovers, right? But now yeah. there's a helicopter flying around. Do you know when they sent that thing? Two years ago. Two years? Oh, yeah. How long does it take to get to Mars when we send stuff up Two there? years? Two year years? and a half? Year and a half. Yeah, it takes a while. So this project was started a long time ago. So how many people in, com in comments or in chat knew there was a helicopter at Mars? And don't lie. I didn't know. I didn't, I, you know, I did know, but I just was surprised that, you know, you mentioned it to people and they're like, huh? What? They knew about the rover. Okay, so trivia question. Here we go. We're going to do it right now. Get your Google ready, everybody. <laughs> what is the fear of flowers called? First one, fear of flowers. Alex, do you know that? Wrap it up your head. Fear uh, of flowers. Flower phobia. Flower phobia. That's a good guess. So who got it? Nobody? Oh, Jeremiah did. Jeremiah got it. Uh, pansy. <laughs> who said pansy? <laughs> Michael. Michael who? Uh, is, it Gal is it Gallagher? Or Gallagher? No? Gallagher? Gallagher. So Jeremiah got it. Um, by the way, Jer Jeremiah's got a great podcast. Type in your podcast, Jeremiah. But send Jeremiah a book. Give Alex your address. Jeremiah is one of the Jeremiah is the nicest guy, probably in the whole world. Couldn't have been a nicer person. And he lives in the U.S. Yes, he lives in the U.S. Oh, I I love him even more. Yeah, he lives in the U.S. He's good. Okay, and of course this free book, right? It's coming from Hangar One Publishing. It's a plug. Yes. Right? And we're, let's send him the Bigfoot Paradox. Okay. By Levi Makovic. Okay. okay. You know why? Because I like Levi. Yeah, Levi's great. also a great guy. They're all great guys. Levi, if you're listening, you're a great guy. We had fun. We went on a little expedition last fall. We had fun. Where he had his sighting. So, and then Cliff Barockman sent me a letter, a little email yesterday to tell me, because we were, we were discussing UV light and Bigfoot vision. Everybody says, well, they see an IR, IR, IR. Yeah. Uh, I think they see an UV, UV, which is really the opposite of IR, but it would allow them to see cameras even better maybe because things glow like that passive IR glass on a camera would glow. So would it light up like a flashlight almost? Yeah, would, no, like a glow. It just glows. You've seen a big uh, 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 black light poster? Yeah. Under a black light? Oh, they yeah. glow. That's So anyhow, Cliff sent me this thing. Thank you, Cliff. Cliff Brockman. And he sent me this thing about they f just found out that door, door mice or the door mouse glows. Hey, Abe. Um, we could send you a book, too. Abe saying... Uh... Oh, it's no problem. Hey, Abe, you got it, man. Send Abe a book. You can send Abe a print book and Jeremiah a print book. Sounds good. Oh. To, to their U.S. To their U.S. address. <laughs> That's funny. How do we always get that wrong? And we do that all the time. Murphy. I know, but we read, but I don't know. I don't know. A.B., you better not move overseas by the time I <laughs> send that book no. to you. Anyhow, so we're talking about door mice. It's called photoluminescence. Mm. And I think that this, um, like, um, for instance, eagles see in UV, and they would glow for them. Even in the daylight, they would have a more of a glow. 
So I think there's UV and you know rodents. A lot of rodents apparently are UV glowing. And Bigfoots have been known to eat rodents, especially like in the you know in the late fall and whatnot. <laughs> what? That's, <laughs> what? <laughs> Inside joke. <laughs> Inside joke. Okay. Um. That's enough of that crap. So, but the the idea is right that this is why they could avoid cameras because they could pick up on them. Well, that's one. Yeah. Well, that's not why I think that. Yeah. I think that for other reasons, it would allow you to see urine trails. It would allow you to hunt at night easier. Moonlight would make them these animals glow. Flying squirrels glow in North America. Mm. You know, and what do you, what do you think a flying squirrel's favorite food is? It's wood ticks. What would a Bigfoot need help with in getting rid of wood ticks? Flying squirrels have landed all over me. They're not afraid of people. And I then want you go that out to the happen forest, to stand around and just talk, you know, in a nice soft voice, they'll so start landing on you. I would love a flying and they're, squirrel. I think they're looking for wood ticks to eat. Yeah, yeah. I think what I'm going to do is cover you in wood ticks. <laughs> oh, no. Bring you out to the forest and I'll film everything. I like that everything. part. And I'll have you repeat, you know, Mary had a little lamb. They'll land on you. Start eating your wood ticks, and we'll put it in the new Legend Meets Science film. Okay? Deal? No. Um, I mean, that'd be great for somebody to do. Put up photo three real quick. Photo three? It's the glowing dormouse. And they glow red when they're, like, sleeping and more of a purple or bluish glow when they're awake. Or when they're dead, they glow red. When you're dead, you glow red. Wow. Yeah. It's like in a video game. Yep, there you go. All right, enough of that crap. By the way, is crap a swear word? Uh, probably probably how YouTube defines it. I know, but is it? I don't think it is. But, oh, okay. you know, that's me. What do I know? I don't think it is either. Oh, God, what's this world coming to? Okay, in Iowa... They found a 550, this is what they're estimating it, 550 pound, maybe it was a 600 pound um, saber tooth tiger skull in Iowa. Wow. And they learned more about them to they figured out what they eat, whether the diet, you know, they study the teeth, they study the um, um, striations on the teeth. Because you can tell with plants, plants have like silicon in it have you ever eaten like spinach and that like sticks to your tooth yeah all the time. that's from the that's from the silica You're, it's from the silica yeah the, the silica in the in the leaf that makes it stick to your teeth yeah yeah i i know the word for it but it just it's escaped me brain fog today um, anyhow, but they can they determine you know what you know what it eats by the by the scratches. But they did apparently mm. some type of um, something they call biogeochemistry on the teeth to determine what animals it ate, and for sure confirmed it ate the giant sloth, which did exist in Iowa. Oh, in fact, God. if you go to Iowa State University, which I have, you, there's a giant sloth in the entrance. Like a replica of it. Wow. Yeah, it's really cool. Because when you stand next to a giant sloth, you realize, holy crap, they were, they're as organ. Holy crap, they were giant. Massive. They were. During the, play, you know, the Pleistocene era, animals, a lot of them were just went nuts. They were just giant. But could you imagine the ultimate predator would have been a saber-toothed tiger? Can oh, you yeah. imagine that? So just one cool teeth, thing. Uh, teeth that long. Uh, Russell is in the is in the green room, so we're good to go uh, after we share your clips and okay. final finish the news. Um, so anyhow, that's that's the news. I just thought it was cool. Saber tooth tigers used to live probably where we're standing to in Minnesota. Oh, of course. And when I talked to um, Doctor Lynn Rogers, he was saying that's why one of the reasons bears, black bears evolved so skittish is because they had to compete with saber-toothed tigers they had to they had to they um, had to you know escape from them yeah they that were would make they sense. were part of their food mm. and that's how black bears evolved to be so skittish 
Yeah, so I don't know if that's a a his sense. theory or there's some truth to it. So anyhow, there we go. Well, I've got I have I have other things, but I think I'm going to skip them. There was a thing I was going to do on microgravity and the effects, you know, that it has on the human cell. But I don't really care because I'm not going to space. Not, any, not, you not anytime soon. I'll bear, guarantee hardly anybody cares. Nobody's going to space. We don't unless, care what effects. Unless you're space. a billionaire, you're not going to space. Yeah, we're not going. So I equal them. All right, I'm skipping that. Let's go right to my clips. Are we ready for the clips? I, I'm I'm ready. I don't think you are. <laughs> I'm ready. So first one, sound is fine. You can start playing it actually right now, and I'll kind of narrate it through. So we all talk about snow load. You know, people find these big X's. This is how that can happen. So here's a guy that happened to be at the right, right place at the right time. This is happening from probably 2,000 pounds of snow load. Two trees came down. Now, they didn't form a structure, but they, if they would have been on opposite ends, they could have. Isn't that crazy? Oh, imagine if that landed on his house. Oof. Yeah, those are big trees. Those were not little trees. No. Okay, clip two. Speaking of load, this van is handling a load very well. This is the only entertaining clip I'm putting in this thing. But it does show that the elephant is just really intelligent, just curious. I don't think it means the vehicle any malice. It's just trying to... I think it's just checking it out. I mean, that's his hands, and its trunk is its hands. It's just like, oh, this is really interesting. I wonder if this would be a comfortable place to sit. You know, it looks smooth. So there you go. Don't let an elephant sit on your Toyota. Not. <laughs> you did not like that clip at all, did you? <laughs> well, I have a Toyota, so, you know. Oh, okay. Clip three. This is just, oh, my God. It's just if looks could kill. This shows how defensive. Look at that. Do you always show the end of the clip first? You might as well just leave that up there. It just so auto plays. It's, it just, it's TikTok. It doesn't for me. I don't know what kind of computer you have. But look at that thing. I mean, it's obviously protecting its um, piglets. But look at the face on that. It's so human looking. You it's know, not a, it's not a human I want to run into. No, it's really that's actually a pretty amazing looking animal. Didn't you, didn't you think so? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful too. Yeah. You froze again with your eyes open that time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have you ever heard of um, Cinderella slippers on horses or donkeys, Alex? No. Well, they're born with Cinderella slippers, what they call it. And there's a video, right? Clip five. I can't believe it. No, no, what this is, you got clip, okay. Put it, okay, put back, that's clip four. Sorry, I'm on an order. Clip four, okay. put it back on. Animals okay. are adapting to our cities like never before. There's so much footage of this. Go ahead and play clip four. It's fine. Sound is okay. Let's listen. I can't believe it. What are the odds of this happening ever? With the well, McDonald's in the back. Isn't that crazy? Is that a reindeer? Hi, no, those are wow. moose. <laughs> You're just like Joe. You see a moose. Is that <laughs> a reindeer? The They're not reindeer. Reindeer oh, are oh, kind of white. Yeah. They have a white I chest. I thought they were getting ready for Christmas. But aren't those, I mean, those are majestic, huge. Oh, animals. yeah, yeah. But who would think of seeing, a, you know, moose just totally adaptive, calm in the city? It's happening more and more with bears, deer, animals. And literally, Alex, in our audience, we have to learn to just kind of live with them. Yeah. You know, we just got to just go. There's a cougar in my driveway. Oh, well, you just got to go about your life, you know. There's an elephant Literally. that just sat on my Corolla. <clears throat> it is what it is. Well, they're getting like in India, they're the rhinos. Some of the rhino populations coming back. They're getting a lot of rhinos in their towns and villages in India. 
in southern India, and they just they got to just live with it. But we're getting tons of bears in like New Jersey. They're like all over people's homes, living under their porches. They're everywhere, and we just have to learn to live with them. You know, they're just kind of claiming their territory, and we can. I really yeah. truly believe we can peacefully live with animals. Yeah. So, okay, now the Cinderella slippers. That was my fault. These are things that protect the womb of horses, donkeys, and I think deer probably have them too, but this guy actually shows them, talks about it. So I'll go ahead and sound. play the sound. That is super cool, but I think it's really neat. <laughs> Wait, we got to show mom. Oh, yeah, mom's like, oh, mom is rolling good. around. That's so good. That's good <laughs> sign of happiness, <laughs> I guess. After all her hard work. <laughs> you did a great job, <laughs> All right. All right. Check this out. So when the babies are inside mom, they're all curled up. Look how long those legs are. And they get to moving around. And a horse's hooves are hard. But look what they do. Look at this. Can you see this? This is what we call like a Cinderella slipper. See how soft and mushy that is? That pad goes all the way underneath the hoof. Can you see the hoof here? It's hard, just like a normal hoodie. Isn't that cool, Alex? But this is a protective coating. Yeah, so, so it doesn't hurt. really soft. Mom, yeah, it's just like sponge she rubber. It doesn't damage mom's insides. Mm. That is a pretty cool deal. This will fall off in the next day or so. So for our, our podcast list, it's kind of a brown, spongy that cool? looking material. Oh, so cool. Look at this little thing. And All right, that's cool. enough. <clears throat> I did not know that. Yes, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> clip six. <clears throat> Since we're talking about hoofed animals, here's a hoofed animal with an incredible 30-point rack. I've never seen a rack this crazy. <clears throat> Did you see that? And you just uh, have no, you don't care. If you're a deer hunter, this is crazy. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to process all that. Yeah. Dearness. Dearness. Trying to process the dearness. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's what they would call atypical antlers. Yeah. The nice yeah. and outlier. Yeah. But deer hunters relish. I mean, there's like big world records they can get and, you know, whatever. That would be a record. Yeah. And then there's people that collect the sheds. That's all they do is they just look for the dropped off antlers. Okay. Next one is a really interesting NASA feed that apparently has been taken down. <clears throat> this was a live feed. So those are like UAPs. Yep. Cylinder-shaped UAPs. They do a nice close-up on this. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, what did you think of the clip? So you think it's legit? Yeah, that one I do. Yep, I do. Yep. I try to do my best to not put any, you know, hoax clips. Yeah. I try not to. Okay, you know how we're always picking on robots? Yes. This is amazing, this next clip. Clip eight. See, Greg, I'm like, why, why are we posting this? Take a close look. It's cleaning? It's a Roomba. This building has been wiped out by the tornado, and this Roomba is still going. Man. Look at that again. Got... If you didn't laugh at that one, there's no hope. <laughs> no hope. You think that's uh... what shorted out maybe from water? But it's just like, oh, my God. It's nuts. Imagine it really nuts. Imagine the anxiety in that thing. In the in the Roomba? Yeah, the Roomba. Yeah. I don't think Roombas feel anxiety. But it's a, <laughs> it'd be a good commercial for Roomba. Survived a tornado and still cleaning. <laughs> like one of those Energizer bunnies. Of course, it could have been a knockoff version, right? I yeah. think there's knockoff versions. Okay. Um, speaking of tornadoes, after that aftermath, look at this shelf cloud. This is Nuts Clip 9. I've never seen one quite like this. I've seen some. The worst one I've ever seen destroyed my house with hail. But that shelf cloud is just crazy. 
Look how high up it is and how low. It looks so alien. Yeah, so when you see one of those, get in the basement. It's not good. Definitely get in the basement. And in your case, that ain't happening, is it? You don't have a basement. No, I don't even have a torpedo tube to hide in. No, your brother does, so he's got a torpedo tube. Yeah, but we don't know if that thing's going to You know, his thing, I got went in it, and it's like a space capsule. Yeah, That's what it reminds me of, like the, like the Mars capsule. It's yep. pretty cool. Yeah, you should buy one. Yeah. Yeah? So For you're just going to go to the bathroom. I'll call you up. <laughs> Alex, get in the bathroom. It's a tornado. Okay. I mean, a lot of people live without basements. So um, this one is a um, clip. Apparently, you're just doing it on your own. Clip, <laughs> <laughs> clip eight. Since it came, I was talking about rhinos roaming around town. There's lots of footage of these rhinos roaming around southern India. Or, yeah, in India. But it's gentle. It's just, it startles the dog, but it doesn't do anything to attack it. It's very docile. Isn't that crazy? And the All dog... Right. The dog lays down again, like 10 feet from it. <laughs> no, 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 no. The rhino's gentle. The dog is definitely. Oh, scared. yeah, yeah. But like the dog ran like 10 feet away and then he lays down again. Like, don't, doesn't everybody think Alex is a little off today? <laughs> Just a little bit. I'm, I'm at my finest. You're not. No, you're not. You're yeah. not at your finest. <laughs> I think you work too much today. Probably. Okay. So this is this next thing. Bonus clip, but this is a thing that's kind of freaky. Because I guarantee there's probably nobody knows this. It's just one of those little known facts. Don't play it yet. <laughs> Jeepers, creepers, dude. You are definitely way off. You're ahead of me. Okay. So, you know, we thought that's, okay, the picture you just saw, yes. everybody thinks of that as our solar system, right? Mm, solar system. Solar app. system, yes. That's what we think about. But that's not the way it is. Not even close, because the sun that we're orbiting around is zooming at 450,000 miles an hour. Okay, so now everybody here, everybody in the sound of my voice, picture Earth. We're going around the sun 38,000 miles an hour, and the sun is traveling through the Milky Way at 450,000 miles an hour, and we're being dragged as all the other planets are being dragged while we're doing this big old loopy lose 450,000 miles an hour. So picture so, the ultimate, the ultimate ride at a carnival, you know, like it's doing, uh, you know, two axes spinning. So what are the chances that, that <clears throat> we can just sit here and relax in our easy chairs when we're really zooming at 450,000 miles an hour? That's a so lot faster it, than a Tesla. But did you know that that we're that the sun is rotating around the Milky Way and it takes 260 million years to make a full circle? Yeah, it's a that's a terrifying thought. So just keep watching this. This is what everybody thinks. It looks all safe. No, this is what we're doing. Go ahead and keep going. Look at the planet zooming around that now. What could go wrong here? Play it again. <laughs> okay. Play it again. Now, so if that doesn't make you feel humble, that the sun we're rotating around is traveling 450,000 miles an hour, you know, I bet you, you know, very few people knew that. Did you know that really, Alex? That the sun is zooming through the Milky Way, orbiting through the Milky Way? No, I didn't know that. No, most people don't. I think it's just because they don't want to know. They think everything's just like the earth is just sitting here, you know, spinning. But it's sitting here. No, it's not only spinning. It's then going around the sun and it's zooming through sp space. Raw space that we've never traveled into at 450,000 miles an hour. Now, so, that doesn't freak you out. Nothing will. So the earth is a multitasker. Yeah, but the whole solar system is like a little thing, a little dinky thing that's getting dragged by the sun. Dragged. Yeah, it feels like it. And you're just getting dragged, and we're just sitting here. Yeah, anyhow, okay. <laughs> Off of that crap. But anyhow, it's something to think about, right? Food for thought. So yeah. if you ever want to feel humble, that'll make you feel humble. 
I feel it. You feel it? Yeah. No, you you are <laughs> vulnerable today. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get a drink of my purple junk out of my little tiny Do I have a Russell miniature. on? Yeah, you know, let me read. Let me introduce him. Hold on. Y yes. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Me, me, me. <laughs> okay. Russell is a retired Army sergeant. So we want to thank him for his service. But he is labeled by his by the network, Travel Channel, and he's on as a survivalist, which he is good at. Okay. I don't know if he's Les Stroud. We'll have to ask him. <laughs> he might be. I don't know. <laughs> we'll ask him. Are you as good as Les Stroud? We'll ask him. Okay. Anyhow, in addition, um, he also works at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. I don't know what a nuclear reservation is. I'm not sure I want to know. Do you know what a nuclear reservation is? It Alex? sounds very important. Well, it is. It is important, but I just don't know what it is. So um, Russell has written two novels, which I did not know. I didn't know that at first either. I did not know that featuring Bigfoot. And one is the uh, Footprints of a Legend. The other one is Bigfoot and the Tripwire. And now, now he's focusing on films, including... A, a biog biography of Gimlin, which I think is done and out. Bob nice. Gimlin. Yeah. Nice. Anyhow, Russell, I think he's been on Harry's film four seasons of Expedition Bigfoot. I have met Russell. I have hung out with Russell. I've drinking some pop with Russell. Um, had a few laughs with him. He's just such a nice guy. Very, um, how would I put it? I, I don't want to say it to his face. But he's very soft-spoken but disciplined. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So let's bring Russell on. He'll probably kill me. Saying <laughs> all things. Well, Russell, wow. oh, that's my <laughs> soft-spoken. Wow. Well, you are. You're soft-spoken and very um, disciplined. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You you does. know when you're around somebody that has discipline, personal discipline. One, the way you walk, the way you carry yourself. Um, the way you talk, just everything. Your posture. Posture, yeah. You better sit up straight, Russell. <laughs> oh, I am. And are, yeah. are, you, are you out of town, by the way? Are you at home I or are you out of town? No, I'm out of town. I'm That's doing what some I work uh, at an atomic reactor in another state. Ah. Yeah. That's a good thing to do, work on an atomic reactor. Can you turn the <laughs> lights off? Can you turn the lights off for a few minutes so we can see if you glow? Without, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I'm joking. I, so I, I don't want an elephant sitting on my Ford truck. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> there we oh, go. I don't think the elephant would even would even would even come close to messing with your Ford truck. I've seen your Ford truck. truck. Yeah, I've seen it. It's quite large. Russell has the biggest truck I've ever. It's a pickup, but it's somehow the biggest truck I've ever seen. Did you walk into the dealership, Russell, and just said? Give me your biggest damn pickup truck I can buy. <laughs> no, I actually just bought a truck that I liked. Well, I always oh, have to man. get a white truck and, and paint it, uh, put the black stripes on it. But I put a lift kit and big tires and oh, just man. all the silly stuff you can put on a truck. Yeah. It's too so much. Cool. Yeah, too much stuff on it. Well, you, you drive a lot, as I, I remember. Like a lot. Yeah. Like tons. So if you don't know about Russell, I think he drive. You, you, you enjoy driving versus flying. I prefer to be able to stop the vehicle and step out and get fresh air than get yeah. on a big cylinder tube with about a hundred people I don't know. I'm so with you. I'm so with you. <laughs> when we film Legend Meet Science this year, we're not gonna we're not gonna fly once. We're just gonna drive everywhere. Good. You know? Good. Yeah. I'm with you, man. Yep. Um, okay. Season four. Correct? There's a season correct. four. There is. And then and that's going to air this January or this, or not just January, this December or something. When's it going to air? Nobody knows. That's the thing. That's probably the biggest question I get asked. We filmed it. Uh, oh. It's in the can. It's edited. It's ready to go. But if you recall, last year, um, Travel Channel switched over to uh, Discovery Plus. Yep. Yep. And then also in the last year, there was a merger between Discovery Plus and Warner Brothers. So it's just as that big, I didn't know. 
big wrestling match to see who gets what yeah. and what they're going to do with it and who uh, who's going to show the the program and win. Nobody knows when. Even the, I, I I harass the producers all the time. Hey, when are we going to see that? Because if it if it goes well, then we'll get. I'm hoping to get offered season five. Yeah, right. Yeah, because so you don't even know. That airs. No, I don't. God, that's that got to be hard. Not knowing yeah. what you're going to be doing next year. You know what I mean? That would drive me nuts. Not well, being I, I have my 100%. job. I mean, I'll do my no, job. No, I know, but yeah. but you need to make arrangements with your job, your life, your family. And plus, mentally, it's just kind of fun to know. Yeah. But yeah. you're disciplined. You don't care. Nah, not really. You're just uh I'm jealous of you, man. I would, however, I would like to go to a different planet just to kind of check things out, do some exploring. You're not gonna. It's not happening. I, I know. I know. I need a, so, I need a sponsor. Because apparently hey, Rex your apparently Rex your cells, but I didn't read the article because I know I'm not going, so I didn't want to know what it does What's to it your mean? cells. My cells are already wrecked. Come on, oh, I've yeah. already lived my cycle. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm good. Oh my god. Uh Anyhow, so you're so Alex Russell's the guy, guarantee he gets up, flies out of bed, does two backflips, and does 50 push ups, right? I don't do the backflips, but I do get up and I bet you wake you myself do. up. Yeah, yeah, do with some yeah. exercise. Yeah, he's Russell is in amazing shape, so yeah, I can I'll testify to that. I got out of breath today putting my socks on, Russell. <laughs> don't think that I don't either. Oh my I just, god, I'm I just like, hide it. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Okay, so um, where, where do we, I want to cover new ground because I know you, get, you do plenty of interviews, but I really want to cover new ground. So I want to know, how do you guys all get along on, you know, do you ever debate? I, I know you all get along, but do you ever debate anything like where you don't just, you know, don't just, you don't agree on what method of research to do and things like that. But I know you guys all get along. I didn't mean that, but. No, actually, we have pretty extensive conversations because, as you know, I'm I'm flesh and blood. I think that if I walk up and I, I touch you yeah. and put my hands on you, I know you got a heartbeat in there and you're warm because of that, that um, heat in your body. So yeah. I know you'll put out a thermal. I know you need oxygen. I know that you move. So I think that anything that moves on this planet, that hasn't been built by man, is flesh and blood. Okay. So, so I, I have a, I've always been. Of that mindset, but Ronnie, Ronnie has a different view. Mm. He thinks that they could be um, from another dimension, from another planet, or interdimensional. That they don't need oxygen, or, or I, I'm not sure how he would how he would state that. So I got to be real yeah, careful. probably like metaphysical. We, they're here right, when they're right. here, but they can right. zip away. You know? So if if something can zip away, if if I had the ability to be here and zip into your studio and just do a live conference with you. I wouldn't need, I wouldn't leave footprints. I would just show up. So that's why I think that this thing is flesh and blood because it leaves footprints. It leaves um, yeah. markings behind yeah. something that doesn't need to be that, that is weightless or can do whatever it wants at will. Wouldn't leave the things that we find in the, in the forest. But the good thing is I'm not closed minded either. If Ronnie's white, if Ronnie's white, if Ronnie is correct, <laughs> we just got banned again. I need, I need coffee. <laughs> What's in this thing? Um, if if he is correct, then I will, you know, I'll gladly accept that. I'm not so okay. uh, stuck in my way that I think that I'm always, you know, that I'm right about it. I know that I don't know, so that's yeah. a healthy place to begin. So, yeah. Russell, based on your experience. You know, what would you say if you're a betting man on the chance that that theory has any weight? Like, like, would you give it like a 2%? You know what I mean? Of like there being something more than it being physical flesh and blood. Um, you know, like 3%, 5%. Are you really on oh, like? Quite honestly, it's 50-50. I'll, I'll give 50, it a good 50. high percentage because well, I don't have proof and neither does he. Yeah. Mm. So until we get to that in threshold then I have to be that open about it. I, right. I have to accept whatever comes my way. Yep. I believe in energy uh, from uh, things that have been here before. I think, uh, and that's a whole nother conversation, but I think that when we pass, there's an energy that stays behind. Whether I become a ghost or whether I just become an energy that is just becomes part of the earth 
or if uh, I don't know how it works. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't, you know, put a fingerprint on it and say this is exactly how it is. Right. So do you um, do you have a theory? If I if I asked you, what would be your prediction on this whole mystery is going to end? Because it's got to end at some point. So what I would think... be your What would be your prediction? How is it going to end? Slow by little bits of evidence or do you think somebody's going to catch one or shoot one or run them over with I, a truck? God, I hope not. Um, I, even when I do my presentation, I take it as a, a, a giant puzzle and everybody brings their piece to the table until we can complete this puzzle. Whether it's um, enough DNA, enough hair samples, enough footprints, enough audio vid video, enough of everything to where we have what we need to actually see it or to actually find out where it is. It's like everybody asks, why haven't we found um, bones or, uh, you know, anything like that? I, I know that grizzly bears exist, but I've never come across a grizzly bear skeleton. And I know they're out there. Mount Lion's the same. So does nature consume what is lost or... Are they like uh, like a cat that will climb underneath a porch and just let, right. let life pass? Yeah. And they go deep into the earth and the caverns and just let it go? Or do they, they bury their own like we do? Right. So well, there's I mean, so if many you're, different. Right. If you're, but if you're talking a rare animal, too, I mean, there's not much chance you're going to find its bones. Look how many right. black bears we have in North America. Oh, my God. We have 40,000 in Minnesota. I've never seen a bear skeleton. Neither have I. Never. Not once. No. Although so the one, there. it was funny though. I was um, doing a show with um, Scott Walter from History Channel, and I said that to Scott, and he goes, "Well, I found a bear skeleton once," and I'm like, "Oh God!" It's like, yeah, well, you you are the one in a jillion who did, right? You know, it's but pretty rare. What about pretty a mountain rare. lion or a cougar? Yeah, exactly. They're they're there. I know they're there. You know what's interesting though? Um, like I was, you mentioned cougars. I was in the town of Cougar, right by the Pinshaw Gifford National uh, Forest. And I was talking to all these townspeople. I mean, I was interviewing tons of them. Literally not one person had ever seen a cougar. Every one of them had seen a Bigfoot. I Really? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, okay, okay, this is my cheesy dad joke of the day, but I, actually, right, go. Did, I actually did see a cougar um, uh, not long ago. Um, in in downtown where I live, and she yeah. was driving, I believe, a blue BMW. Oh God! Yeah, we're getting oh. banned. <laughs> I, I knew you. I knew you were going there. I, yeah, I knew I'm it. Sorry, I knew it. I, I told you. I I told you ahead of time, cheesy dad. <laughs> That's right. You should have known that was coming. Yeah, that was actually a. Uh, never mind. Terrible no comment. Joke. No comment. Yeah. I just want everyone to know we don't endorse anything our guests say. No, 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 we don't. No. What's that thing they put at the beginning of every show? Yeah, we're gonna have a disclaimer. disclaimer. Yeah, disclaimer. Yeah, disclaimer. So, have you guys? You know, I want to talk about this show just a little bit behind the scenes. Have you ever had an embarrassing moment just being out with all those people, all those weeks and times? What's your most embarrassing moment, Russell? Not. Not even gonna share that with you. <laughs> oh, come on, is it that embarrassing? <laughs> no, I've had a couple of doozies. Um, there's been a couple. <laughs> I mean, doozies. I have plenty to pick what pick from because I'm I'm we'll not the most one. graceful guy. Okay, I'm not the most graceful guy. <laughs> so, I mean, there's pick that. one. Pick one. Come but, on. Okay, here's an easy one. Um, this is 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 kind of silly, but I have a backpack that weighs 92 pounds. I know. Yep. I know you have everyone. Yeah. And I'm 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 doing my little ninja stuff. I'm stepping through this uh, all these uh, fallen trees in a river bottom, and I'm getting you know I'm I'm doing my dancing across the top of these these fallen logs, and I I didn't make a step one time, and I tipped over backwards. Now, when you fall on top of a backpack, well, that's a that's a pretty easy landing. It's not gonna if you land on a rock, it's you got a big backpack between you and the rock, so you're not gonna get hurt. But what happened? was the way I landed, I couldn't even shed free of the backpack. And it got wedged in the logs. 
So I'm literally stuck there like a turtle on my back. And I, I was helpless. Oh my Just God. Upside down, <laughs> hanging upside down on my backpack and my straps are holding me in and I, I couldn't, it had my, one of my elbows was wedged in and I'm, I'm just, that was horrible. And oh I had to get, God. I had to get pulled out of there. That was really awful. Now I weigh 230 pounds and 92 back, 92 pound backpack. That was a lot of weight. Gosh. So poor cameraman Zach, um, it was everything he could do to get me freed, but it was awful. Just awful. And I've landed so, in the water a couple so times. So somebody asked, how do you end up with a 92-pound backpack? I know, because I've seen the contents in Russell's backpack at one of your talks. Like you, you, I, think you, I think you talk about your backpack in your, yep. in your, when you speak. But go ahead and just give us a real quick laundry list. What's in that damn thing? Everything you need to survive. Yeah. So if Zach and I, it's just the two of us, we go out and – we push as far and as much distance as we can, just because I want to cover as much territory as I can. I I don't have to follow a path. I get to follow my instincts. So we take off running and we're gone for days. So I have b extra batteries, extra flashlight, um, thermal imaging, night vision goggles, food, tent supplies, extra socks. You got to have dry socks. Yep. Um, cold weather gear, rain gear, um, everything you can imagine. Because it, if you get out there and just suppose a storm comes in, you're stuck in the elements for a while. Then I have to be able to make sure that we survive. Yeah, and, and um, I would imagine you come back in pretty good shape from one of those trips. Pretty tired, I mean, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. That's a, that's a lot of weight to carry up in elements. Somebody was joking and said you have foam padding in there. Uh, that's all. I, just foam padding. That would be, that'd be great. That would be great. Yeah. But I could no, probably carry, I could carry a five pound backpack, Russell. You'd be surprised how much that you could actually carry that backpack yeah. more further than you think. I, I've had, it's funny. I had a, uh, when I do a presentation, I'll, t I'll wear my backpack out on the stage and I'll set it down mm. and I'll let anybody who wants to come up from the audience, put it on it, but they have to walk around the, around the outside of the crowd and back and replace it. I had this little gal, she, uh, she couldn't she couldn't have weighed more than a bag of skittles she was just a tiny little thing little blonde i'm trying to remember her name port, port uh i can't remember but she's wearing red high heels and she put that thing on and walked with it and that was a that was an impressive sight to see because it yeah. it weighed as much if not more than her it's very interesting yep so do you ever do you, do you carry any firearms when you're out, or do you go firearm free? We are we're handed bear spray to carry with us. Okay. So we, there's and, and pretty much if you are um, if you're smart about how you navigate through the mountains and are aware of your surroundings, a bear spray should be sufficient. Yeah. Could you imagine me seeing a Bigfoot? No. Spring. That would be quite... <laughs> I don't have want you, to try that. Have you thought about that? <laughs> you know, everybody says, you know, they say, uh, what are you going to do if you run in, you know, come around the corner and you come face yeah. to face with Bigfoot? What are you going to do? Yeah. And um, and everybody has their plan. You know, everybody's, you know, got a, some idea in mind. And I've played this out in my head many times, but I'm going to grab the cell phone right here that I'm talking to you on. And I'm going to run up and turn it backwards and get a selfie. And I'm going to grab a fistful of chest hair and I'm going to run as fast as I can. <laughs> that's, that's, plan. that's that's my big plan. You know? Yeah. So yeah. hopefully that'll do it. Yeah. You could grab other things and rip and run. Do uh, a rip and run. Hair. I, I, I think yeah. a good, good fistful of uh, good hair will do. Oh my God. What my imagination was running wild. What else grab and run? <laughs> Grab and run, yeah. I can't even tell my cougar joke. <laughs> Come on. I didn't tell a joke. I didn't say anything. I didn't say a damn. It was the implication. Oh my goodness! Yeah. I keep uh, keep saying naughty words. You carry oh, a okay. combat knife with you. <laughs> okay. If anybody has questions, for, I, was, I was going to say if anybody has questions for Russ, put them in all caps, and that way we can ignore them. Oh, nice. No, I'm joking. Put them in caps, and we'll we'll notice them better. Please. Okay. Lately, um, I've been doing a lot of stuff with Zach Hall, the, the camera guy. 
Um, he lives in Kentucky and I've, I've oh, met up okay. with him several times and we'll do some live feeds or, um, we'll put stuff out there on my, um, Russell Acord public figure page on Facebook. And, um, he's, I have to say, he's probably one of the most amazing people I know. Zach is he's, okay. Yep. Yeah, he's even tempered. He, he tolerant of me in my silly ways. Huh. He keeps up with me in the woods. Now, you if you think carrying a backpack is hard, and which which it's it has its struggles, but I can use both my hands if I'm pulling myself up a up a mountain or keep my balance going down. But he keeps up with me, holding this camera, and he's navigating through all this treacherous terrain. Well, he's and, filming now and filming me, and he's keeping me in the in the camera. And he's not using his hands to stay balanced. Uh, he is he is an amazing cameraman. So I, I have to say he's he's the deal. He's the real so, deal. So I'm trying to talk my son Blaine to take me into the Boundary Waters backpacking on this it's one place where he had a lot of rocks thrown at him and recorded all this crazy activity. And he's like, You'll never make it. You'll never make it, Dad. You'll never make it. I'm like I can always rest when I get tired. Right? Isn't that true? You can always just sit and rest if you need a breath. How far is it for you to get to? 15 the miles. 15 miles into the forest. But there's a trail. Pace yourself. You yeah, should be, able, you should be exactly. fine. Exactly. Are you going to go stay the night and actually do yeah. that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Stay a few days. So, well, I mean, you it's... You have time to get there, time to get back. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, I just... That's what I keep telling him. He's like, well, you'll never make it. He thinks I'm going to have a heart attack or something. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, your kids, they just think you're, like, you're totally fragile. feeble, fragile, oh. feeble. There's no way. I mean, oh, my God. I said, dude, I could probably outpace you. So we'll see. I'm not at that fragile stage yet. No, no. No, you, you look like you're made of concrete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm a survivalist. I'm going to survive. Um, somebody, Tate Hieronymus, said oh, Tate. about the fer pheromone drone idea. He's like, who thought of that? What does it matter, Tate? <laughs> who it thought of it? Me. It, it wasn't, wasn't you. me. It oh, was okay. it was a it was an idea that was presented to us that we should try it. It's been used before. Yeah. Um, in the past, I think even uh, it's, it sounds silly to say this, but back in the day, um. Bob Gimlin and a few of them did the pheromone testing in the blues in Washington quite a while back. And, and what happened? It, uh, they discovered nothing from that. Um, the other animals, it, it, it's, it seems like you have to have the, the correct pheromones to, to make something react to it. So you and I would not react to um, pheromones from uh, an animal that d didn't really matter to us. So it's got to be something that matches that primate, matches that um, if they're trying to uh, get a response out of Bigfoot, you have to have Bigfoot pheromones. Well, I, I, I know a lot about those pheromones. You're talking about those uh, orange chips, right? <laughs> or are you talking about some other pheromones that you guys got? Um, no, that was actually a liquid base that they sprayed into the forest. Oh, okay. Have and you tried was, the orange? Have you tried the orange ones? Because... I'm the one that went to the scientists to get those developed and they're made from gorilla and human okay. vaginal bacterias or enzymes and then um, cultured and then combined just right. as a, you know, basically a wild guess. Right. And who knows they were, but I do know this, the first time they were used, the skookum cast was cast. And then, you know, Randall's. that's, that's what I, that's why I wanted them developed for that expedition. And they walked away with um, the Skookum cast, you know, so I would call it a success. And some people say, well, they're, those are, that was proven to be, no, that was not proven to be elk. It was the exact opposite. We, we, you know, got elk legs from the butcher shop and we did everything we could. We worked with anthropologists on that. Um, Dar Dr. Derek Swindler, all sorts of people um, studied it, and it's not elk legs. You know, that was a body cast of what looks like a Bigfoot that sat in the mud. 
So now that was wasn't that the Olympic project? Derek Reynolds and Derek was involved. Uh, Rick Rick Knowles, um, Matt Moneymaker, quite a few people. Yep, yep. Yeah, I've actually I want to see the cast. I've never actually. You, you probably seen should. It, yeah, if you ever get yeah. um, around Seattle, I can arrange it for you to to go look at it. I, I wouldn't mind seeing that. What, where do you who, live, Russell? I don't it? even know. Uh, Rick Knoll has it. Okay. All right. Because I, I have a pretty good dialogue with uh, Derek Randalls, too. And he's. Yeah, Derek can I've, get I've, you access to it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. And I haven't heard from him in a while. Maybe I should do it. Maybe I should check up on him. Well, where do you live, Russell? What state do you live in? I live in the state of Utah. In Utah. Very cool. Yeah. I, I so you're never in there. Washington. No. Never. I live hardly. Um, not nearly enough. I have a home there, and then, uh, but I had a home in Washington while I worked at the oh. Hanford nuclear site. Okay. And then um, I'm starting to I'm starting to do traveling where I do the nuke sites or atomic reactor sites throughout the states. Um, I do we do demolition. Yeah. So we take down some of the um, reactors uh, that are decommissioned and find a safe way to do it where nobody gets hurt. And oh, make it a okay. livable property oh, again. Very cool. Um, yeah. uh, Debbie um, Boyce said it. it said she wondered if we could see her comments. Do you have your comments turned on? Well, you couldn't see yours in a cell phone. They're too small. Right. Tons of comments. It's just they're flowing really quick. We have a lot of people in live chat. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm sorry. I can't. I can't see them. No, he can't. But we yeah. can. So we'll. Okay. We'll we'll just kind of keep. There's tons of questions. There's no way we can ask all of them. But. Um, Debbie said, um, do you prefer research by yourself or with one other person? Only one other person. If yeah. I can get by with just, just me and one other person, I prefer it that way. You keep your footprint low. You keep your sound um, very quiet. I mean, you can, yeah. you can get through. Zach is really quiet. Um, somebody I really have enjoyed doing research with is Adam Davis. Um, mm. He's he's very, very knowledgeable. He's yeah, he's just got a lot going on, and uh, smart. He's a the brilliant, oh, brilliant he guy. Yeah, he, he's don't. Brilliant. Well, no, I don't want to give him credit. Don't say that. Okay, Watch he's this. not that brilliant. He'll get all puffy chest and think he's all that. Yeah, yeah actually, nah. he is. He is all that. He's a yeah. he's a dynamite guy. <laughs> he's a nice. He's a very nice, um, yeah. nice person. Um, so um, let's see here. Kevin Morrison said, uh, "Oh, what's next for?" Bob and how is Bob? That was one of the questions I was going to ask. How is Bob doing? I talked to Bob. I I don't get up and see him as often as I I did when I lived eighty miles from him. Yeah, but I do I do see him whenever I get close to when I get to Utah. I drive up. It's about a fifteen hour drive, so it's not that bad. I'll go see yeah. Bob, spend a couple of days, see how he's doing. But I talked to him on the phone just recently too, and he's just he's in good spirits, but. Um, his his days of going to conferences are over. He doesn't. Uh, the last one he did, I, I in fact was right there in Yakima where he lives at because he he wanted to be able to sleep in his own bed at night, uh, and that just traveling to be away from home is no longer appealing to him. But he still loves meeting people. I mean, <clears> that's that's a huge thing for him. Yeah. That's, that's where he thrives the most. But uh, health wise, he's he's in his nineties, so he's yeah. slowing down. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine yeah, that. Crazy. Yeah. After everything he's been through. Yeah. But he's he is one of the nicest um men I've ever met. Agreed. He's yeah. just a gentleman. He's just anybody who could actually spend time with Bob and think he was making that story up is nuts because there's just no way. Now you mentioned that I did a documentary on on Bob. Yes, <clears throat> I did. That was just a little bit of something to to kind of get get started. I'm working on a documentary that is that is much more in depth and much more care is put into it, and it's about Bob the man. Yeah, you know, he it, a lot of people don't know a lot of his history and who he was as an individual. A lot of people only have that piece of it that okay well he rode horses and he's a cowboy but he did this bigfoot thing and that's not his identity you know that's that's yeah. a, a big part of his life because that's what they they've stuck to him but he's so much more deeper than that and so much more <clears throat> going on he spent 30 years not even thinking about bigfoot because 
He never, yep. he never went to conferences. He didn't do anything. You know, right. he was, um, in fact, I attended the first conference that he finally got talked into going to in Willow Creek many years ago. And he was like freaked out by all the love and the people were just yeah. flooding him with autographs. And he just like, he couldn't believe it. Well, he spent so many years people harassing him. Right. Uh, and it was so difficult on his marriage. His wife worked at a bank. And when you're in a bank environment, you can't yeah. snap back at somebody who says something horrible to you. Right. And she's she's a rock. I'll tell you what. She put up with so much and the ridicule and the comments and everything yeah. else. And it was I, it had to be difficult. And nobody can take that and not be affected by it. Yeah, no, I know that. Um, that's Judy you're talking about, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yep, Judy. Um, and Bob, um, so devoted to her, and was so affected by, you know, the effects it could have on his marriage, and you know what I mean. He, yep. his marriage was priceless to him. He yeah. didn't want it. So that's that's one of the things that I yeah. I made a comment one time, and it got so blown out of proportion, it turned into this this big uh, circus. But I said um, that I'm doing a, a, a documentary on Bob Gimlin. Yeah. And I said, it's not what you think. And people took that so out of context. Oh, it was ridiculous. Yeah. And the thing is, is what you just said earlier, that Bob is the nicest guy you could ever meet. Yeah. And he is. He's a wonderful human being. And when I say it's not what you think, it's not Bob just always talking about Bigfoot. It's Bob talking about the effects of what it did to his marriage, what it did yeah. to his life yeah. and the people that he was absolutely quite unhappy with. And I let Bob just, <clears throat> I, I let him cut loose and he, he gets, I, 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 I was, I, he does, he gets Teary -eyed. Emotional. He gets yeah, I know. really, yeah. really ticked yeah. off and it's raw. I mean, yeah. it's, you can't, you're sitting there watching him. And when I play it back and I watch Bob yeah. and you're, you're watching this superhuman breakdown and just, come to terms with the the horrible effects it had on him. And then he says what he feels. He just yeah. speaks his mind. And it's not what you see at this smiling Bob nice conferencing. He's ticked off and he says it like it is. Mm -hmm. And when people finally get to see this, they're <clears throat> going to realize that this sweet guy was, he really was affected negatively by some of the people that came into his circle and, and harassed him. Yeah and mistreated him or took him for just took advantage of his nice, nice guy. Bob yep. thing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I remember him, you know, I remember him telling me that story because I'd asked him, I said, Bob, would you be willing to do a TV interview? You know, this is many years ago. And, and he just didn't want to do it because he didn't want to start going and have that start up again. And, uh, you know, he was happy to be at the conference. We didn't want any publicity, didn't want to be on TV. Right. And I, I kept saying, Bob, but this is so historically important in case you pass for some reason, in case something happens, this needs to go on record. Right. And he did agree to do it at the last second. It was like the sun setting. It was like, and, and uh, I remember it was almost dark and he finally goes, okay, I'll do your interview. And I grabbed the camera and it's like, I didn't even white balance. I didn't even care. Just started filming Bob talking and, and of course, he's done stuff since. But you know, right. for me, that was a desperate moment um, to know that this may be his last and only. He had never done a TV interview ever, you know. And so, God, he's just such an amazing guy. He has done so much in his life that Bigfoot was just a tiny, right, tiny little right. thing. It was no big deal. In so fact, he thought it was no something. biggie. Yeah, I did something that's kind of interesting with Bob. Um, no, he, there's a guy in town that says that it's a hoax and that he wore the costume that his name is Bob Hieronymus. If yeah. you go to Bob's house, step out of his front door and walk down the street a half mile, Bob Hieronymus lives right there. I know. So when I did all this interview with Bob Gimlin, um, I don't, I, I don't think any court case should be decided without hearing both sides. I just think yeah. that's just in all fairness. I'm biased. I, I, I think the world of Bob. So I told Bob, I said, you know, I'm going to go inter I'm going to go interview your neighbor. And he said, what? And I said, I don't want you being offended by this, Bob. I, I, I think that it's only fair 
that I put all of it out there. And I want to hear what this man has to say and let him say his piece. It would be so one-sided if I didn't allow that. So I went down. Um, I, I, um, Bob Hieronymus had agreed to let me interview him. So I went to his house in his living room, set up lighting and camera. And I sat and talked to him for a couple hours. And when you when you see the film, I don't hide anything that Bob Hieronymus said either. But there are certain things that, that are so obvious to me that aren't adding up. Yeah. And, and I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say anybody's right or anybody's wrong. You watch both sides of it. You have to decide for yourself. I don't, no. I'm not going to tell you what way to decide. You have to. Well, that took guts and that took guts on your part to uh, do that because yeah. you don't really know Bob Gimlin would have reacted because of all the, you know, cause I, I remember um, when that story first came out, I was, talking to Bob quite a bit and fixed him up with my lawyer um, for um, libel because it was so bad what, you know, they were saying about him. And yep. and he just wanted to explore the legal ramifications of all this. And and I remember my <laughs> Ledger Meet Science was, was about to come out. And I remember them calling me going, well, we don't have to run your dock now. That it's all been explained away. And I'm like, what? Are you, we were done, edited. I was doing interviews on the radio. It's like, no, 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 no. Wait no, a just minute. There's been a guy claiming this every you know, X amount of years. Yeah. So yeah. ignore it. Oh, my it's God. It's interesting it just... because it, it didn't. I couldn't piece together what he was saying and make it right. Yeah. There was no way I could. I could. uh so and you'll have to hear it. You just get to hear it. Yeah, let's leave it there, and then people can watch yep. your doc. But I will say that that was um, probably in hindsight that was a great thing that you did. Certainly, the skeptics in the audience will definitely give you kudos for that. For but sure, you have to hear both sides. Yeah, you don't. I mean, you, lawyers get to argue both both sides of the case, and the jury decides. Yeah, I want everybody to have that choice as well. So you feel like you did maybe even Bigfoot, the Bigfoot community, a service by showing both sides to show that you were trying to do a balanced view of the whole topic. Absolutely. And, and what it does is it, it will either um, satisfy those who believe one way or, or the other way. I mean, it, they're going to both, both sides will get what they want and they'll, they'll feel like, okay, now I have this, this bit of information and they'll be able to either stack it up and, and make sense of it, or they'll break it down and say that that doesn't feel right or, or doesn't seem right. Yeah. And I think any good researcher is willing to question everything. Don't make up your mind before you go out in the woods that you are going to see it or you're not going to see it. Go out, be open, and, and, and absorb what comes to you. And same with information. You know, you hear yeah. Bob Hieronymus, you hear Bob Gimlin, you hear testimonies from everybody all over the place. And it's... It, it's it's frustrating because it's such a hot topic. There's there's somebody who who plays in the um, in the film world and computer world, and they change things. And I I could I could take a picture of you and change the tint or the the you you understand film how this works, and I can change it any color I want. I can make, you know, put things in and out of that photograph of you and make you look any way I, I please. And people do that to this old film from 1967 and try to make a case, which is, is really difficult. But I happen to have gotten, mm. I, I got the, the, uh, the holy grail of film. So Rene Duhendon had the, the actual copy, the actual film. And he made several copies on, on that real film, straight, straight from the original copy. He mailed it to Bob Gimlin. And there's also one from John Green as well that wasn't from that first generation copy. And looking at the two side by side, you could, there's such a, a difference because the one from Rene Duhendon is quite clear. The other one is, yeah. is pretty clear, but not as clear. Right. So this roll of film still has it, it's still in the envelope that Renee sent sent it to Bob in. 
and it's that same reel to reel. I took it to Arizona and got 4K. I first they they handled. I mean, they handled it like it was an archive and gloves, everything, and they cleaned it, made sure Whoa. that there was no dust on it. They took it frame by frame, every single frame, and I have one copy of every single frame in 4K. And I have the original film that that Bob was given. Well, good. So yeah, I hope I, I hope I hope it's being. Um, I don't know how you preserve film to keep it from deteriorating. The Kodak, know, the Kodak film comes in that package that is got the aluminum and the plastic on it, and as long as you keep it dark and sealed from the environment, so let moisture get to it, that sort of yeah. thing. Because this is as clean as the day it was shipped. Wow. It's it's not brittle. It's but it's just does it just does it preserved. help if you um, freeze it or cool it or put it I in th- a freezing and cooling you like you, you do that to a piece of metal it. it'll, it'll rust yeah. yeah so it's just it's it's at room temperature it's in its original sealed packet and it's only been touched that once since I got it and put back in its original space and protect it oh cool so it's Very it's cool. a good it's a good piece of film and um, i don't have to touch it again because i have the best version possible right the 4k yeah, we got the digital one. yeah 4k yeah. will be good for a while yeah. um gabriel has a question um russell has anyone <clears throat> with your group generated eye shine from a very possible bigfoot you know while you're in the field at night have you ever seen eye shine I've seen something, but it's like um, what I saw was reflective. I've not seen a generated eye shine. And, okay. and people say that they see where there's no, if there's light behind me, right. even if you wear a reflective vest in the dark in a construction site, any kind of light will make that glow right back at you. So anything that has that reflective piece to it will, um, any light that you have, so suppose I, I point a um, night vision camera at you, okay, and, and you're in that, um, uh, like a PBS-7 military-grade night vision goggles. Yeah. If there's light behind me and it's shining on you to, to illuminate you, and you're wearing reflective colors, I'm going to get that shine back. So whatever I've seen has mm-hmm. had light towards it to reflect right. back. You've, but nothing in sheer darkness. Well, have you seen eye shine? So, so you think you might have seen Bigfoot eye shine, but not I've eye seen, glow. I've seen um, reflective, but not eye shine. Okay. And I and and without without being close enough or without, I, I'm not going to call it Bigfoot anything, right? Because I don't have any evidence to back that up. Yeah. Right. So I I would rather walk away knowing that it was unexplained or I I'm not sure. Because you look, you shine your lights at a deer; it does the same thing. You get that reflective yep. light back at you. Yeah, from the uh, mirror membrane in the back of the eye. Yeah. Tapetum lucidum. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's see. I'm glad you remembered that word because I was I was trying to pull it uh, out of my archive. I'm on dial-up, coal-fired, slow browser <laughs> right now. I'm just, I'm so tired. <laughs> I get these brain farts and just like, I cannot remember, you know, a word, something I know. Oh, yeah. like we were talking about the teeth scratches, at Alex. Phytalist. That uh, silicon and plant material is called phytalist. That, I just couldn't remember it. You know, so, uh, excuse me, I've been, I've been dealing with some chat stuff, but, uh, so forgive me if we, you guys have already talked about it, but, um. You know, being a military veteran, has that influenced how you uh, approach researching Bigfoot? Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. God, yeah. I know it has. Go ahead. Not in a hurry. Methodical. Take my time. Detail. It's about detail. And um, I'm learning as I, I as I go, too, because he, hunting down evidence, what a human leaves behind, is much different than hunting down evidence that uh, an unknown leaves behind. So you're pretty much... You have to you have to observe everything, everything you can that seems out of place. So it it sounds like your approach is is getting everyone to almost slow down and and take in all the details that might have been glossed over. Right, and it's those little tiny pieces of the puzzle that that piece it all together. So it, it's like even in the show, you'll see me slow down. I'll back up and I'll look across the plane of the the Earth's floor. 
and see if anything is disturbed, if anything is pushed down or laid down. Now a deer will, will spike its little hooves into the ground and do that little indentations. But a, a big bear or a human footprint or a big giant footprint will press down a lot of surface. And if you step back and you look at it from a distance, that's much easier to see than if you're standing right over top of it, especially in grass or it's just knowing um, those certain shapes to look for. And it, it, it just, I'm not great at it, but I'm learning. I love that. <clears throat> You're just learning. Yeah. So Elliot um, said, um, he said he loves, you know, Expedition Bigfoot. And he goes, what's the best way to change a tire? I saw your video. Very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I loved it. I saw that video, too. And you're saying. Good. Yeah, I, I, well, I'll, I'll mention it from my perspective because he's like, do it in your driveway. Because if you can't do it in your driveway, you know, when you're at home and you're all comfy and warm, then you're going to have a real issue if you have a flat tire in the field. Yep. I mean, that was the gist yeah. of it. On the slippery slope, side hill, trying to change a tire with a, a jack. But you didn't. But you didn't us. address how to do it. <laughs> so he was Ever. saying, "How do you do it?" <laughs> oh, that's okay, part two. Be my next. Do I need part... to do my tutorial? I'll be happy to. <laughs> yeah, he'll, he's going to do a to. tutorial, Elliot. Yeah. He'll you know what? I'll find a vehicle that that has a really um, horrible jack and a and a tire that doesn't work. Mm. And I'll tr and I'll make the attempt, and then I will show you the proper tools in order to make it work. So, it, it, yeah, it's right. You challenge somebody to do something, but if you don't follow through and show them the way, then the people that don't understand it, it's going to get lost on them. So maybe that's. I'm glad that got brought up. Yeah, and I was joking about who's the better survivalist. You were Les Stroud. I was joking, of course, because I'm sure Les is, or maybe not. I'd have you? <laughs> Have you had um Where's the survive? Button? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Anyhow. You know they have alien versus predator. There needs yeah. there needs to be a Russell versus Les Strau. Oh yeah, that'd be a show. Oh just you're both dropped in. off in the middle of nowhere to do some yeah. Bigfoot research. Drop okay. uh, we'll drop you off at the south end of Vancouver Island and less of the north for a month. And we'll come back and see if uh See who see who's just there with bones, skin and bones, or see and see who does it. But you you do have formal survival training, correct? No, uh, I do seriousness. Yeah. Yep. And you know the thing is about that, it just gives you that confidence when you're in the woods, so you can focus on what the hell you're doing and not be worried about this and that because you know you've prepared mentally yeah. and physically and and what's in the backpack. Well, a lot of it is, is you know, and Les, I'm, I'm not going to speak for Les, but I, I'm guessing that he would say the same thing. It's if you have, I mean, I, and I ask the audience this when I'm out there, I'll ask a couple to come up on stage and, and tell them, okay, I'm going to take you and drop you in the forest with only what you have on your body right now and mm -hmm. nothing more. How long are you going to survive? And, you know, I've, I've heard some pretty wild stories. Well... It, it just some outlandish, I'll, I'll chase down an elk. And it's like, do you, do you have any idea how fast an elk <laughs> runs? But, but anyway, but it, it's a matter of being able to take the tools that you have on you right now yeah, and make use of them and understand the environment around you. There's so much out there at your fingertips. People walk by every day and don't realize I can eat that. I can survive with that. I can, I can build a fire with that. I can build a shelter with that. And it's being able to identify those things. And if you don't, then you're in trouble in the woods. And yeah. Les is very, very good at that. He knows what to eat. He knows how to build what he needs to, sur to survive and, and hunt. And that's, I mean, that's what makes a survivalist is, is the identification and implementing those tools for survival. Well, we, all know, we, we all know how Les got interested in Bigfoot, but how did you get interested? That's a good question. Same thing. Same thing that got you guys interested. I was, I was a kid and my parents, we were back East and I'll, I remember the town cause it was Romney, West Virginia. Mm. We went to a theater as a kid and I watched that the guy t looked like he had a cone shaped piece of, of, uh, of the head of a Bigfoot in his hand, just the cone 
and they were talking about the shape of the head and you saw the walking across the river bottoms and you heard that that haunting howl that that um goes with that story i saw that original and i walked out of that theater thinking if there's something out there i'm a kid but i'm thinking if there's something out there i'm going to see it i want to see it for myself i want to know i want to know for sure and it was like the hunt was on for me and my dad my dad was also a bit of a survivalist he was ex-army he liked being living off the grid we uh, we always lived way out in the mountains and if I, even at seven, eight years old, if I got off school uh, on Friday and I would tell my mom, hey, I'll be back tomorrow, she didn't worry about me going up in the woods and doing what I needed to and come back because she knew I would eat. She knew I knew how. So for me, it was about getting out there and searching. I didn't know what I was looking for. I had no idea how to, you know, real research, but at a very early age, I was looking and I, and I, I have a whole nother story about that, that I saw something that I well, was tell it. supposed to see. Yeah. Let's, uh, um, I want to hear that story. This is more Ken Gearhart and, and, um, uh, you know, Lyle Blackburn is, I saw a bird that flew overhead. Now you got to understand, I, I'm, eight or nine years old. I'm a kid. But something, there was no sound, but something passed between me and the sun. And the shadow was enormous. And I looked up just in time to see the tip of a wing cross over the hilltop and out, out of sight. And it wasn't just a large bird. This was something astronomical in sight. And whatever it was, it, uh, I mean, it was a bird in the sky but it was a large even to date it was the largest thing i'd ever seen in my life don't know what it was and I, I i talked to ken about it once but you you always think okay well maybe as a kid you know i'm really tiny and a, and a cheeseburger looks huge you know so maybe what i saw in the sky was just a just a large bird but this seemed out of proportion even at that age i i felt like it was it was something that I was witnessing something amazing. Like some sort of a was. cryptid maybe, or a terrorist or a gargoyle, I mean, something. See, I, I don't know. That's I, And I've had a fascination with Mothman when I heard about that. Mothman, yeah. Oh, man, yeah. So I think there's things on this planet that we, we've yet to see. Um, I don't think we have a population problem of Mothman and pterodactyl or, you know, uh, anything that that people are, are seeing right i mean they you say that they're i you i hear testimonies i think if there was a bigfoot in every single story that i hear we would have a population problem with bigfoot i think a lot of times people see something that they perceive is bigfoot but is not um, i saw something uh, as a kid that was not bigfoot but from a distance when i saw it walk away from me i swore it was and it was uh, you know uh, was it, it was a moose. It was a moose. Uh, from the you back. Think about yeah. the big, long legs of a moose and how yep. the, the back has that big hump on it. Didn't have horns. It just walking away and it had its head down. So all I saw was just, and it was far enough away. I just saw the legs moving and walking away and that cone shape on the top and no arm swinging. So it was just, and, and being an investigator or researcher, I had to know what it was, so I, you know, I go down the valley and came back up the other side, and I looked, and it's just big giant moose tracks, and it it made sense to me at that point. Yeah, but it's it's hard for me to hear stories where somebody says, "Well, I saw a Bigfoot, and it was right there. It was like thirty feet away there," and they take a snapshot in this field, and or, or uh, I'm sorry, they have this film footage in a field, and you just see something black kind of move. And they're like, look, there's my proof. This is Bigfoot. And it's six feet of, or six inches of snow. But the only thing they have is just something black moving far enough away. But nobody's going to take the same camera and go over and look at the what yeah. kind of footprints it left behind. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm a stickler like that. I want to see more than just something that moves. I want to, that's why I won't run out and say I've seen Bigfoot. 
because I don't have evidence to to back it up. You want more facts, more evidence. Absolutely. More. Absolutely. I think it, there should be more than just one piece. So you're looking to rule out pretty much everything until it, it has to be a Bigfoot, basically. Agreed. So how do you think the mystery is going to end? What would be a, just a guess, Russell? Serious question. How do you think it might end most likely? You never answered that. I asked you that, but. I think it's going to be. I, I I hope it's. I hope it's not a carcass. I hope it's not a body, but I hope it's um, uh, 4K footage, dynamite, amazing footage with mm -hmm. footprints, hair samples, and um, maybe even a blood sample on the barbed wire fence. But I don't. I don't. If if there's only one left on the planet, I don't want to find it as a carcass. Yeah. So what do you think the best evidence now? What's your, what would be, okay, two-part two, two part question. What would be your elevator pitch? You meet a guy casually, you got five minutes to convince him Bigfoot's real because he's a skeptic, and that's one, one part of the question. The second part is what do you think the best evidence that we possess of a Bigfoot? That's a double-edged sword. And, and the reason I say that is, um, the, the, the nest that Derek Randalls has discovered, uh, the Olympic project in Washington, that's pretty compelling. That's some amazing, but there's no body that goes with it. It's something that is left behind that appears to be or could be perceived as a, a primate nest. But right. there's nothing to stack on top of it. It's just that's a single point piece of evidence. I think uh, if I was in an elevator, and I, like I say, when I say deciding a court case, if you decide a court case, there has to, you have to put doubt in somebody's mind, or you have to give them something to hang their hat on to where they, they are willing to entertain the idea. Okay. Maybe this is real. So let's, and my favorite piece is, um, love it or hate it. The, the Patterson Gimlin film. You put any human today in a big costume and put it around their face, they have, to, they have to pitch their head forward to see out the eye holes, number one. Number two, put big clown feet on them and try not to stumble just walking on flat ground. So take all those pieces of evidence, put a guy in a, in a big suit, put big giant feet on him, and tell him to walk flawlessly across cobblestone in a creek bottom in California. And good luck with that. Then the last piece of it, look over your shoulder and keep walking and make a couple strides as you're looking over your shoulder. Yeah. And tell me that there's there's nothing to the Patterson Gimlin film. Yeah, plus it's doing a, a tightrope walk. That's so hard to do. Um that that's a, you know, it leads me to a good question, and that is, you know, because obviously there are are the skeptics. Has any skeptic seriously tried to go out and recreate the Patterson footage? Like, like this can be fake, la da 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 da, and 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 tried to make their own footage. There was the, the, what, the there was the what BBC film Russell. Yeah, that, it was horrible. A couple people have tried tried to do it, but even on uh, uh, that's the thing. Even on a flat surface, um, how big were the feet? How many inches was that footprint? Because I've I've got that patty cast that bob has yeah it's like 14 14 14 15 inches but okay if it's 14 inches but you have um you're wearing shoes that are 14 inches and you're not used to that big of a foot underneath of your body and you're and you're walking this pace over top of cobblestone do you realize in prisons they put a a, a, a chain link fence with concertina wire on top of it and then there's a span of, of cobblestone and then another fence. Right. Because if you get over that first fence, <clears throat> there's no way you're going to navigate that, that cobblestone to get to the second fence without stumbling, falling. That's, that's a great deterrent for the human body to run across that stuff. Oh, God, yes. And that was so soft soil. and Yeah. It was hard to walk in. I mean, I was there at Bluff Creek right there where this thing walked with Bob. And it's like. Yep. Um, it's hard to walk. It's like walking in deep beach sand. Yeah, the sand and cobblestone, the distance that thing covered, and it, as it walked out of sight, 
Yeah. Not a single flaw in the, in the smoothness of the gate. Yeah. So this thing walked seamlessly. And I don't know of anybody that can, that can walk in a costume. Well, e- even in a costume, you got to see where you're placing your feet, especially when there's hazards. Do. Yeah. So, and this thing didn't look down, wasn't picking its steps. It w- kept continuously smoothly walking as it walked over, looked over its shoulder. It's one of those films, the first time I saw it, you just knew right away it was a real animal, real creature. Just your instincts tell you that. It's like if I showed um, anybody, Alex or anybody, a guy in a bear suit, and you, you know, it's like you know it's a guy in a bear suit. Right. It's instant. Right. You just know. It's like not like that. Um, that's, the, that's enough doubt to make somebody stop, think about it, and dig into it a little bit more. It's so difficult to dismiss with that kind of just that kind of evidence. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Uh, Hollywood hasn't seemed to make anything even no. comparable, even even today. You know, with all the latest. Could advances. you imagine the hit TV show if somebody did, or hit you know one hour TV special if somebody actually built the Patterson suit and really duplicated it? You know what I mean? It would be a yeah. very popular show, and no one's done it because they can't do it. It would be an embarrassment for them. It would take a lot. And well, and by today's standards, look at what we have at our fingertips right now. Yeah, exactly. To make it look like that and walk yeah. like that. Well, yeah. that's true. So I, I hate to change the subject, but um, I, I do want to kind of pay attention. This is a little bit of a special show, having you, Russell. And, and, and because we're only on Facebook tonight, um, we will be posted on YouTube tomorrow, just so everybody knows. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, Marie had a question. How did you get picked to do the Expedition Bigfoot show? I have no idea. (laughs) I I love it. I mean, quite frankly, the only thing, the the only thing um, I had, I was doing the uh, International Bigfoot Conference. I'd written a couple books. I'd become friends with Bob Gimlin. And um, for some reason, they wanted somebody on the team. Uh, that was, I, I, and I'm I'm be blunt when I say this, but they wanted a highly regulated a hole that was a skeptic, and I don't know why my name came up. I mean, <laughs> <come on. laughs> but but I am I'm I'm very regulated. I'm very and like you said, I'm disciplined in how I think my processes. I'm yeah. not so arrogant that I think my way is always right. But I I I research in the methods that serve me well, that I'm comfortable with, but. I, I, I'm not willing to take every tree knock or every sound or every audio and say that's Bigfoot. Right. And that's, that's what they wanted was, was that and, and the guy to take you out in the woods with him. And that's, that's what I do. Have you ever been hurt on one of your little expeditions or? I have. You have, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but you're not going to tell us what happened. <laughs> Nope, not gonna. I'm not gonna. <laughs> no, I already gave you my embarrassing moment. Okay. Okay. No, it just you you can't cover that kind of ground yeah. and not turn an ankle, right. tweak a knee, fall, bang yourself up. Um, I mean, it's just the because my I I want to go at a certain pace, and I'm too dumb to know to slow down. When I know where I want to go, I'm just I'm going. And yeah. um, Zach fell. Um, during one of the seasons uh, when we were in Kentucky, he fell and hurt his knee really bad. Mm. The injuries happen out there. Yeah. I know Maria got hurt a couple times. Ronnie's been hurt. Um, and it's just driving on and pressing through it because you want to finish the season out and make sure that the the viewer gets what they need and they get to see your, you know, your research real time. Yeah. But you, nobody gets away unscratched. A um, couple of things. Pat Collins had a question, and then I want you to put Jay uh, Katz's comment up. And very nice comment from Lori. Yep. Um, Jay Katz had a nice comment. Yeah. I can't read it, so you know. Oh. Tell me. Showcasing nice? the truth about Bob Gimlin, his honesty and humility is just as important as proving Bigfoot existence. Thank you, Russell 
comma, respect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So it's a nice comment. Um, Appreciate that. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. John's like Mr. Witt. Okay. Stop propelling down cliffs to deliver a hair, Russell. Um. <laughs> You realize how much time that saved? I mean, realistically, I believe, it. I believe if it. you had. It took me so long to get up that that mountainside, and I, the only way to, that I could have got back down was probably a little over a mile down the mountainside, and then back down all that rough terrain. And, oh, that's um, a blast to up. do that! Just down you go. Yeah, sweet. So, yeah. so it, it's I did like, that in Belize. I got a rope. I'm going. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> I did that in Belize. Yeah. We were caving in Belize, and man, that was so so cool just to go down, you know, two three hundred yeah. feet on a rope so quick. It was so cool. Okay, well, I was able to. It, 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 I'm gonna. I'm not gonna lie to you. It it was the laziest way down, and more fun oh, yeah. going down that way. So I'll I'll take lazy for about yeah, five repelling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not that's not hard. It's it's climbing that's hard. Okay. Um, yeah. See, it's here. I'm just looking for some of these cool questions. Tim had a question. He uh, he was wondering if oh. you could only get pack three things for an expedition. That's all there you go. Get. What would it be? Definitely, I would take thermal imaging for an expedition, not survival. Yeah. Uh, if it's for expedition where you're doing research, thermal imaging and um, a DNA kit to collect anything and everything you could. And some kind of a, well, just throw your cell phone in your pocket because it records audio and video, something that you can actually record with. Good point, yeah. But thermal and, imaging gives, uh, gives you the advantage at night. I was just going to mention, if, you, if anybody wants a DNA kit, Shelly Covington, Montana, actually sells authentic, proper DNA collection kits. So and I think you can get a hold of her on Facebook. Um Pat Collins had a question. How big was that print you found in Washington under the bridge? I don't remember. I honestly don't remember. Um, and I know that we discuss it on the show. We talk about the the, the size because we oh. measured it on camera. But I've, I've been, there's been so many footprints that we've put casting material into since that show. It's I, It's... I'm sorry, I don't remember. So one, it was big. one yeah. Um, then Paul Guffey said, "How close has Russell been to a Bigfoot?" I'd be interesting answer. I I get a I get that a lot, and the my only answer to to that is I don't know because you don't. I've seen things that I I think might have been Bigfoot, but I'm not willing to sit here and look at the camera and say I'm sure of it. I won't do that. Not until I, I have something. Mm -hmm. that I, I'm not going to say it until I can prove it. That's just as simple as that. Perfect. But as as good at being unseen as these things are, I don't think anybody knows how close they've actually been to one being out in the woods. How intelligent do you think they are? If they're so smart, I want them to take the calculus class I had to take. <laughs> um, I don't. Well, as far you you have to think about what's that's a very subjective question because you think about what element in it it has to be intelligent in. So in the nuclear industry, the nuclear industry, I'm pretty I'm pretty confident in my role in the nuclear industry, but when it comes to things that I haven't studied on. Or that I don't have the education in, I'm an absolute idiot. So it just depends on what format we're looking at. A a intelligent as far as um, hunting or a like uh, other animals. I I think my opinion is I think they're very intelligent when it comes to surviving, staying out of sight. They don't need our help with anything. Mm at all and we're, <clears throat> we're supposed to be the top of the food chain do you think they're potentially like smarter than like, let's say like a gorilla i would say yes 
but a gorilla is in the environment that a gorilla lives in. Yeah. They're the, they, you're not going to outsmart a gorilla in its own environment. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just like, a, it's, it's that balance of where, where you draw the line at. But you think maybe one of the things that they're really strong at is, is avoiding like just pure stealth, contact. Yep. avoiding contact. I can move quietly in the woods if I want to move quietly, or I can just blunder through the woods, dragging my feet. So if something that wants to stay out of our path, that knows how, will stay out of our path and know and knows how. A moose <clears> could <throat> run right by you. I don't know if you've been in the woods when a moose runs by and there's no branches for it to knock off. They can be very quiet. I don't know how they can with that huge rack. It's just crazy. I know. Well, I know, but they are still rack. Well, that's true, but I've seen that's male moose dad go. Joke, but I'm not <laughs> I've seen male moose go through the forest. I'm like, how do they even walk in the forest, let alone get through yeah. so quietly? It's amazing. They are. They're very quiet. They are. Um, somebody had mentioned. I mean, it's a good question. I don't really want to go there, Gregory. But he had, um, he had mentioned um, how you like your production crew, basically, because obviously it. you really love your camera guy because you. He's like your no, best research partner. It, that's the one part of the year where four years in a row, we've all gotten to get together and mm -hmm. it's like a family reunion. It really is. And what's fun is the production crew, the, the guys that run the okay, camera. Alex, the you can editors, take that down. <laughs> they're all a blast. But when it comes to Ronnie, Maria, Bryce, yeah. when the four yeah. of us get together, right? it's, it's, and we talk all the time. I mean, Without the show, we're talking all year round. We're on a we're on text together, we're cool. on the phone. We talk about investments, kids, lives, career, yeah. all of it. Very cool. I've made very very good friends just being able to be part of the show. Yeah, that's nice. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think here if anybody. That, normally, I don't do shows where I just answer every damn question, but it's been some really good questions that have come in. It it sounds like you've got you know still a very full career. How are how are you able to balance that with the show? Is there a certain amount of time that you a lot that you you, know, you take a leave of absence, vacation? Like how, you know how long does it take to shoot a season of this show? Over a month. But what I do is um, I we I accrue PTO, and my job knows. You know, I, I don't hide it from them. You know, if I get a season five, you're going to have to give me yeah. about 35, 40 days off back to back in a row. So let's make arrangements for somebody to take my place while I'm gone. If it happens. So, so you guys shoot linear every episode. It's all linear. Back to back. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Very efficient way. And plus um, you tend to, I would imagine you get more done by staying tuned into a, you just travel in, stay there, travel out. Yeah. So yeah. there's not a lot of costs and going location to location to location. Yep. You find a place and you just stay you there. You stay there. Yep. For the whole time. Yeah, no, that's cool. That's, that's a good way to do it. Um, yeah. I've never had the pleasure of doing that. We've always had to jump around from place to place to place to place. But, yeah, no, I think uh, I think what you're doing is right. For, for 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 very serious research, um, um, I think your whoever's in charge of your production is that's that's the right decision. What cracks me up is we'll we'll be someplace. I, I get my 35, 40 days off, and I yeah. know I have that a lot of time off. And then I know that we're only going to be able to stay there for a certain amount of time, and then we have to get pulled back out. And it's it's we'll get comments on there. I can't believe you guys left after you know you were getting so close. It's like, well, Maria, Bryce, Ronnie, Russ, we all have careers, families, jobs that we have to get back to. I can't stay out there for an extra month. And when it, when you do a film like that, when you're doing that kind of thing, you have to have permission to be there, to be on certain pieces of land, and, yeah. and to do the investigation like that. And that expires after a certain amount of time as well. So you can't just go in and habituate and stay there for um, six months a year because number one, costs are astronomical after a certain amount of time. Permission runs out. We have our lives that are beyond what you see on the show. As much as I'd like to stay at some of these locations, Alaska was the toughest place to leave 
I loved Alaska. And that is probably the wildest, most wonderful place I've ever been. But yeah, you're, you can't you're, stay you, there. You have Alaska written all over you, Russ. It's like <laughs> right here. I could see that. No, I could see that. Alaska would agree with you. Yeah. That's some crazy, crazy primitive land. I mean, where a grizzly can come out and just kill you in an instant. <laughs> you, you wait till you see the show. Yeah. I, I, I got killed four times in that season. It was crazy. You did? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Does your family worry about you when you leave? Probably. Probably. <laughs> He's, he's never. They've never mentioned it, so he doesn't know. Never, <laughs> insurance, like, is it about time for you to leave, check. Russell? <laughs> yeah. Isn't it time to film season five? <laughs> oh my god, it's got to be tough, though. I mean, that's a long time to be away. Yeah, and, and for even on a career standpoint, it it does test the boundaries of being able to keep a job. I have an, I have a good working relationship with. Sounds with like the people it. I work with, I, well, yeah. <clears throat> so otherwise, I don't know that too many jobs that would tolerate that. Yep. Alexander um, Petikoff has a question. I don't know if you know who he is. He yep. he's a filmmaker too, and he's a yep. great guy. But go ahead and throw yeah, Alex his question. Has there been any time the network producers have asked you to? Do things that didn't sit quite right. But, by the way, Russell, as your lawyer, I, I advise you not to answer that. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm going to, I'm going to just be tap dance around that a little bit, but I will tell you that sometimes, um, because I, and I don't mean this in a bad way, please don't take this the wrong way, but there's sometimes I will see something and I will dismiss it as, well, I know what that is. And they want to hear more about it. And it's like, look, I'm only going to sit here and talk about bear crap for so long. And then I'm yeah. going to move on. Yeah. But, and, and I understand that what they're doing is they're trying to, to make a point that there's, there's a lot of bear in this area. There's a lot of this going on or, or that sort of thing. Yeah. But they have no, a story. They have a story to tell. Yeah. yeah. They want to, they want the audience to stuff that I understand. And I just walk past, they want to pull in the reins and say, Russ, Next time you go past something like that, take your time right. and, and yeah. talk about that a little bit. And, and educate. Give them a, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, no, it's a good, good environment to work in. Well, I would imagine you hear a lot of stories from witnesses and, you know, I mean, I talk about Bigfoot all damn week long, it seems like, and I'm sure you do. Um, have you come to a conclusion whether you think they're aggressive or very, very docile or once in a while aggressive or, you know, where's your opinion there? Dangerous, I guess. Is the... Are they black bears or grizzlies? <laughs> exactly. There you go. The equivalent. Um, uh, actually, they're their own entity. And, I, and I'm and i going to say, and, and that this is strictly opinion, uh, it carries no weight. Right. In my opinion something that wants to be left alone and goes out of its way to be left alone is something that has no fight, no, no skin of the game to argue or fight with us or come after us for any reason. Yeah. But on the flip side of that, I'm a pretty calm guy, but you back me in a corner and you'll see my, you'll see the other's ugly side of me. And the same goes with a toddler. If you start pushing a toddler or pushing a child at some point, they start resisting you and they'll start flexing up and, and kind of pushing back. So I think if you push hard enough on anything out there, regardless of how kind and docile and calm it is, there is that breaking point where it turns and faces you and the fight is on. So I think what we're looking for um, has no fight with us and does everything it can to avoid us. But I do believe that if you corner something like that in a cave and it feels threatened, there'll be a reaction that is probably not the desired outcome. That's a good, uh, good, thoughtful answer. Mm -hmm. Are there any um, states that you really, uh, not counting Alaska, any states in the lower Alaska. 48? <laughs> any, sta any states in the lower 48 do you think that are underdogs oh. in the whole Bigfoot thing? Uh, my favorite places to do research, quite honestly, is... Um, Northern California, 
mm. Oregon, Washington, definitely yeah. Washington. But if I had my choice of, to go anywhere I wanted to, and you're going to be surprised to hear this, I'm not going to say Alaska. I want to go to the Yukon Territory. Yukon. How many roads do you think are cut up through the Yukon where nobody's ever been, ever? It's not much up there. A few that's, diamond mine claims, that's about it. Yeah. Untouched soil. There's yeah. vast wilderness that no man has ever set foot on. That's where I want to go. Have you done a trip like that yet, Russell, where you've been 500 miles from the nearest road? Uh, I, I did some exploring in Alaska when I was much younger. I did. Um, I took off out of Banff, Canada, one time, mm -hmm. and got up into some of the some of the wild country. My dad and I did a trip from Seattle up to Alaska, and I remember going through that Yukon Territory. We just stopped, and I spent a couple days. Just I always had to keep an eye on where the truck was behind me because it doesn't take you long to get out in that wilderness. And I was young. I was probably 20. Mm. So my navigation skills were not as sharp as they are right now. But going out in that country, in Yukon territory, where there was no roads. So I had to keep an eye on every landmark around me to be able to get back to the truck. I love that. Yeah. Because that, that, cool. that chill factor, that, that tingle up your spine – is boy i could get turned around i may never find my way out i have to know how to survive in this environment well one thing you need to put on your bucket list is to get on a float plane have them drop you off at a remote lake after a six-hour flight <laughs> and take off and leave you there alone or maybe with a with zach or something that's still like such amazing where you're just so many hundreds of miles from a road or a trail that's I've, really freaky. I've done that. I've done that in Alaska. We we flew out of Wrangell. Oh, okay. It was my dad and I, we flew out of Wrangell. We, you know, all the little uh, water planes are like taxi yep. cabs in New York. Yep. 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 We got flown out of McGrath, and I think we went almost 160 miles away from McGrath and got dropped. Oh, God. In the middle of nowhere, nothing. Isn't that cool? My dad, my dad wanted to do a moose hunt, and the first night, there were wolves every direction. Oh. It was so, you talk about not sleeping. And, but we, I mean, we were armed to the teeth. We had every kind of weapon you could imagine because we knew we were getting into an environment where um, if it came to survival, we'd better be prepared. But wolves, we had, uh, and dad finally got a moose down. Here's the, here's the ugly truth of what happened in Alaska. He got a moose down and he, tied it up in a tree we, we quartered it and, and brought this thing up into a tree so it was probably 15 feet off the ground so in the middle of the night we heard something cross the water down below us we we're on a, on a little creek so something crossed the water down below us and we couldn't get our flashlights on it whatever it was it was just barely out of sight and then we heard a bunch of limbs breaking that were right behind our camp and we sat there with a campfire as high as we could all night long, armed to the teeth, you know, waiting for something to come out of the darkness at us. And the next day, the, um, the top two quarters of my dad's moose was gone. And the footprint that that bear left behind had about four inches in front of my, my boot. And I wore a size 11 boot. The oh, biggest track I'd ever seen in my life. Nope to grizzlies. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> Grizzly, Kodiak, whatever it was. Yeah, it was, right. It owned the night. And there was, the... we could have done anything. Something that big. Our our big 308 rifles really probably would have had little effect on something that big. Yeah, that's, that's what's one of my biggest fears. I have no fear of black bears. None. I've done so much. You know, they're just so different than a grizzly or a hump bear, bear with a hump, whether it's a brown bear or whatever it is. Uh, nope. <laughs> a humpback bear? Humpback bear. I say nope. There we go. But, yeah, yeah, no, I bet that was freaky. I bet that was. I, that was, that's some spine-tangling fear. Yeah. You never forget that. So what are your thoughts on the uh, smell of Bigfoot? Um, 
you know, people claim they smell it sometimes. They don't smell it. Like the sulfur smell. Do you that, think it's, yeah. well, it's like rotten, fleshy, yeah. I don't know, sweaty dog. It'd probably be all the above. Yeah, and so you get close to a, if you guys have hunted, you get close to a, a, a elk, it has its own distinct smell. I can tell you if an elk is in the forest next to me, I, I, that smell is very distinct. Same with mule deer, they have their own smell. Bear also. A porcupine even has its own smell. And I, I can identify whatever I'm in the woods with 99% of the time. But when you're in the woods and they're, because that elk has that uriny kind of, they do, they have their own uh, pungent odor. But I've, I've come across a smell in the forest that didn't register on any panel anywhere. And that's when the hair on your arms go up and, and you, you know, you get very aware, you know, of your surroundings and you start wondering, oh, there's something here that I'm not familiar with that I'm, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. I need to be eyes up and paying attention. So, yeah, I think, I think, um, and I've heard that from very, very many testimonies that it has mm -hmm. that skunky wet dog, almost a vomity, rotten meat yeah, smell it's, it's because putrid. of diet. Yeah. Yeah. I had an encounter once when I was um, deer hunting. Um, not only the smell, first it was the smell and then there was a chest beating. And what was really interesting, Russ, is as we met back in camp at noon, every single person in our hunting party, and we were all about a quarter mile apart, had the same story. So whatever it was went from stand, deer stand to deer stand as an intimidation that must have put out the smell and the chest beating. It was just crazy. Um, I have a story for you then. Well, let's tell it, please. Oh, by the way, I just want to give credit to Kathy uh, Westerman for that smell question. Go ahead, Russ. Nice. Thank you. Um, Mike Feltner and Mike Miller from the Ohio Night Stalkers. A um, couple really good guys, and I, I do enjoy them. They're, they're pretty – they get out in the woods a lot, a lot more than most people I know. So – Feltner has, he has a voice. I mean, he's, he can really bellow it out there. I mean, he's, he's got some vocals on him. And they, I finally came to Ohio and said, okay, take me out. Show me what you got. You know, because they kept saying, hey, you're invited anytime you want to come out. So I went out and saw the guys. I'll tell you what, Mike did a, a vocalization into the forest and things get kind of quiet and you're just kind of waiting. We got a response back that had that sam samurai chatter sound to it. It was the mm. weirdest thing. And that's the first time I'd ever experienced it in person. Oh. And, and, uh, and that, so you heard, that was, so you heard kind of almost talking, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it wasn't like yours and my voice and it wasn't like, uh, you know how sometimes people can make fun of somebody else's voice and they make those funny sounds. This was a vocalization that wasn't um, a human emulating something like samurai chatter, chatter. It was that deep, chesty, weird, weird tone. I mean, it was just very odd. But the point I'm trying to make is when he would do the vocalization and we all just sit there and listen, we got the parabolic mic out and we're, we're trying to listen. And we caught that, that audio or we'd hear something in the in the trees so i said okay mike i want to we're going to try something different he said what's that i said you're going to do something with me we're going to go down the road away from where everybody else was uh i had i had uh um jeff byers was there so jeff byers and mike miller stayed at the truck feltner and i went down the road a piece and stood at this you know big giant valley out in front of us I said, just do your just do your audio, your vocalization once, and let's see what happens. And he does that, and you hear something like a something crack, um, branch on branch across the way. And I have I don't really put a lot of stock into tree knocks, because anything can make a branch knock into a, a branch. And as, unless I see Bigfoot with a club smacking on a tree, then I'll buy into it. But until then, I I I, I understand that it's a sound, and we're going to just go with that. 
and the the forest kind of got i mean there was nothing really notable when he did that and i said mike when when a primate does something like that there's that pounding on the chest and that vocalization so what i want you to do is i want you to do the vocalization and i'm going to pound on my chest as hard as i can for mm. maybe five seconds uh, ten seconds <clears throat> as long as my poor little chest that's can interesting take it, you know yeah so we did that and we tested that probably five or six times and i'll tell you the difference in the night when we did that the locusts the insects everything went dead quiet and that was the most Ooh. weird it, mm. it was like uh, you know that ringing sound that's always in the forest you know in in ohio they they stopped i mean wow. completely stopped and it took them probably 30 40 seconds to start start back up again and start with their sound but that's the first time i ever heard the forest go completely quiet absolute silence from a chest with, beat for, and from his vocalization and i followed it with the chest beat and then later on i just tried beating on my chest and nothing happened but the vocalization was that 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 precursor and the beating of the chest it was like the forest had heard that before and they knew it was time to be quiet so that was that was kind of that's what i call good research because you saw the difference and you were able to measure the the silence that the forest brought on after the combination of those two sounds well, um, there's twice I've gotten responses of chest beating, both times, and one was on the East Coast, one was on the West Coast. Both times we were playing a very particular coyote sound, and then we got chest beating. Very interesting. Huh. Um, I'll have to share that with you sometime. I'll shoot you that coyote recording, but it's this one, this one sound. And when I had it in the East Coast and the thing kept beating its chest getting closer every time it would beat it would be it was so close there was a guy with us um and um, he started almost crying he was so afraid because the chest beating started out like a mile away then a half a mile then a quarter mile then next thing you know it was a block away and then it was right on top of us let me ask you about that sound then yeah um have you ever been in the forest and heard blue grouse hitting their wings on a on oh god yeah on a yep, fall many tree. times yep i'm a okay and it has a has a very similar sound it not really i don't know not really it's just that big loud thumping hollow sound the frequency of a grouse wing is much quicker right and when you hear uh 800 pound animal going boom 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 the frequency is very slow that's why i asked you but it was to, very poppy very hollow chest sounding yeah you hear that big deep hollow impact you know it's or, big or the sound that like a like a drum with a pillow over it when i was and deer hunting and that happened the... russ i could feel the vibrations of my in my in my skin wow. i remember that then the you know then the the um the stink i had to put my scarf over my nose but the fact that everybody in my hunting party had that same incident happen really said that this thing took the time to go from person to person and say hey you're in my area but, I just um, got a notification that my phone is down to fifteen percent. Uh, I hope okay. I'm not. No, no, I'm you, not ruining your show. No, 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 no. We're we got to we got to book off in four minutes. I think oh. that's our max we can go, but we're going to take you right to the max. So we had four minutes. <laughs> that's, that's Somebody, cool. um, oh, um, David Ellis asked um, whether you David. whether you thought the voice was raspy. The voice remember Which, when you said the samurai kind of chatter uh how would you describe it like a smoker's voice so yeah a little bit of a grit to it it wasn't uh crystal clear like uh no it, it did it had a little bit of a a gruffness to it like a like a smoker mm. i mean that's the only like, way i can really say it kind of that you know that real metallic David, kind of sound uh, not metallically it was it was a deeper um i hope david is listening because i know that mike and yeah, mike wanted to reach out to him to send that audio to him because we recorded everything and i don't know if it's picked up on the audio 
but I know that oh. the layers have to be pulled apart and see if we can yeah. isolate it because, yeah. and I don't know if it came up, came out on that audio or not. I have a feeling it's, David's going to want to interview you for his new book coming out. It's called Unknown Sounds, and it's going to have the IBT technology where you can hear all of these different sounds and yeah. all in the print book. It would be very cool. Nice. Yeah, so um, he's going David, you I'll, want to interview Russ, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he probably said not so much. <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah. Russ yes, who? I want to interview Russ, he says. <laughs> Okay. Um, David, if you get a chance, ask, reach out to Mike Felton or Mike Miller and see if that audio is available oh, because cool. I think you'd have a good time breaking that down and, and hear it. The sound was, was, I hadn't heard that before. Yeah. Honestly, I had never heard that Very before. Cool. In the woods. Yeah. It was pretty neat. Very cool. Um, yeah. let's see here. Thanks for coming on, David. Yeah. I like David. Yeah. He's, he's a very talented oh. man. Funny guy Amazing. too. Yeah, he is. Yeah, I uh, unfortunately I have to talk to David every few days. <laughs> we every time I call him, it's like we end up on the phone for like two hours. <clears throat> That's like, like like me and Jeff Byers will do that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I ask. That. I have one question to ask him, and two hours later, it's like, yeah, we we need to get off the phone. Well, yeah, when you find somebody you have a lot in common with, you just kind of go from one topic to the next. Yeah. He says I'll reach out to Mike. Yep. Please do. So, yeah. It's all good. Anybody else? One last. We have uh, one minute left, and then um, we're going to say our goodbyes and ask Russ if he's got any links you want to share or any any uh, way people can get a hold of you, or if you don't want people to get a hold of you. I'm, I'm easy. RussellAcord.com. Oh, okay. Great. And then I have public figure, Russell Acord, on Facebook, public figure. Yep. Um, you can reach me through either one of those channels anytime. Oh, awesome. Well, I really, really enjoyed just, um, shooting. Yeah. Uh, shooting, you know what, with you? It was fun chatting. Yeah. yeah. And I really this appreciate it. I know you've been out of town. I know what a problem that, that is. And so we'll let you get your phone charged up. Everybody's saying good night. Thank you so much, Russell. Thank, thank you thank so you. much for all the tons of people in chat tonight. And next Thank week, um, we will be on YouTube, and we'll post this show on YouTube tomorrow. Sounds so, good. Good night, Alex. Thank good, you. Good night, Russell. Good night, Doug. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night, good night everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye. I call you up in the middle of the night. Been bothered by dreams, ain't feeling all right. You give me comfort, say just give it some time. By the end of our talk, I'm feeling just fine. You and I will always know where we belong This ain't no ordinary love we got going on I'll pick you up in my 59 Ford We head on down the road until we get bored Just you and me and the sun and the wind If the rain should stop falling we'll head on home Everybody else can see where we belong Oh, ain't no ordinary love we got going on At the end of the world, together, forever is one And i wait, if ever you should be in doubt And i pray they never can pull us apart And i Every day, but I know if ever we'll be led astray, that I'll find my way back home to you again. Should be in doubt and I